maybe yeah just in fact uh, we are recording now thrilled to be here with my dear friend dr Vestigi. but before we even dig in before we even dive in uh dr Vestigi, would you um uh, grace us with the incredible knowledge of your beautiful prayer any kind of beautiful prayer to open up the session we be i'm sure uh my i know i will i know the audience would be edified as well well let us begin then in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen O oh lord jesus christ we thank you for humbling yourself to become one of us and you who have existed from the beginning from from all eternity humbled yourself to share our humanity and to become flesh in the womb of the ever virgin mary and we pray that through her intercession we may understand more deeply the depth of your love in saving us O mary conceive without sin pray for us who have recourse to thee amen, amen. in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit Amen. Wonderful, beautiful, beautiful. I'm thrilled to be here today, particularly because there are very few people that I think are as qualified as as you are, uh, Dr. Pasticci, to talk about really any matters when it comes to theological stuff, but particularly the topic today that can be very confusing at times for the audience. And in fact, I've heard um, very well-intentioned Catholics not knowing how to unravel this and really wondering, okay, well, what do we mean when we hear justification? Is that the same thing in Catholic theology as salvation? Well, what exactly do we mean by justification in Catholic theology? Yes, well, that's a very good question. Well, the word justification comes from the Latin justus, which means just or righteous before God. The, the, the Greek equivalent would be dikaiosune. Dikaios is one who's just, so the process of being made just. Well, maybe the, the best source on this would be the, the, the Council of Trent on justification and how we would understand uh, what is justification. And um, this is how it's described in the Council of Trent. It's in Denzinger Hunermann number 1524. The, um, it, 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 it mentions this, uh, and those who are justified or, um, by, by Christ. Well, it has to do with a transition, a transition of being unrighteous or un, uh, uh, under sin, under the domain of original sin, and then undergoing this, this transformation and the, the the transformation involves um, being changed, that uh, we receive divine uh, filial adoption. And so with the, it's a transition from being unrighteous and under sin and being now made righteous before God. Yeah. And so, and so, the, the, and it's not just a case where we are considered just, and and our sins have been forgiven, but we truly become just, it, uh, and and so this is understood as a kind of uh, transition. This is it in in Denziger chapter seven. Mm -hmm. So it says the um, the disposition. Let us say you have an, an adult who's now converting. This position or preparation is followed by justification itself, which is not only the remission of sins, but the sanctification and renewal of the interior man through the voluntary reception of grace and of the gifts, whereby from unjust man, whereby from unjust man becomes just and from enemy a friend that he may be an heir in hope of eternal life. So in other words, it has to do with being created anew through the grace of Christ. Yeah. That's what it has to do, to become holy and pleasing before God through sanctifying grace, which comes about by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the souls of the just. So yes, we were, we were unrighteous, we were sinners, as St. Paul says, because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Now, 
there were righteous people in the Old Testament, righteous men and women, and uh, they can be saved, but in anticipation of the saving work of Jesus Christ. So after they died, they went to the bosom of Abraham or Sheol, or we could say the limbo of the fathers, the limbo of the fathers and the mothers. They, and when our Lord descended to the lower regions or descended to, uh, to hell or yeah. to the realm of the dead, as we would call it, he liberated them. But this re helps remind us that the meritorious cause of justification, as the Council of Trent says, mm -hmm. is the most beloved, only begotten Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who while we were enemies, out of the great love with which he loved us, merited for us justification by his most holy passion on the wood of the cross and made satisfaction for us to God the Father. And the instrumental cause of our justification is the sacrament of baptism, which is the sacrament of faith, without which faith, without which faith, no one has ever been justified. So in other words, we are justified by Christ. I remember one priest saying all of this discussion, are we justified by faith or by work? We're justified by Christ. Yep. He's the meritorious cause. And, and as St. Thomas Aquinas pointed out, God could have redeemed us in, in many ways because he's omnipotent, but he chose the most fitting, the most appropriate way by becoming incarnate of the Virgin Mary uh, and offering himself as the acceptable sacrifice on the cross. And then his resurrection from the dead shows us that sin and death have been overcome. So we have access to his, his merit, his, this grace uh, by, by virtue of baptism, and if we lose that sanctifying grace by mortal sin, it could be regenerated through the sacrament of penance. Yeah, that is a very good point that you bring up there. All of the points you bring up, by the way, are very biblical. But what a good point there. So in, in, in Catholicism, we can say we're saved by Christ alone. Yeah. We're saved by grace alone. But... Now, of course, there uh, we have. Uh, there is uh, a document that has been co-signed uh, between uh, the Catholic Church and uh, the Lutherans, which is the Joint Declaration of uh, Justification. But it very clearly shows that if you utilize faith alone in the proper context, faith working through love, you can you can talk about it in orthodox sense. But in the way, the classical Reformed way, we would logically deny faith alone in the way Luther classically laid it down and the way Calvin, uh, uh, Francis, Turretin, and all those other um, pillars of the Reformation laid it down, we would reject it that way uh, because the primarily, is, would it be correct to say, Dr. Fastici, that it really is anti-biblical? Yes, I think, I think so. There were, there were a number of errors of Luther. I mean, mm -hmm. one was understanding justification as imputation and uh, or forensic justification we don't become just we are declared just because of faith alone and yet trent is quite clear no as i just read it's not that we're just considered just we become just we are transformed mm -hmm. they're, they're, we're renewed by god's grace we become adopted sons and daughters of God through grace. So, and, and you mentioned that 1999 joint declaration on justification. We give thanks for that because I think through dialogue, there was, there was mutual agreement, but uh, there was an official response of the Catholic church to this. And it said, although there's substantial agreement on the essential points of justification, there's still some matters that need yeah. further clarification. And one was the issue of uh, just and sinner at the same time, simul justus et peccator. I know some people quote Luther, but we can't find the, the passage where, you know, the, the pile of manure covered with right. a haufen scheiße mit Schnee bedeckt. No, 
it, it was passed on like that, but there's no text we could find. Maybe wow. It, no, uh, Dave Armstrong is a very good Catholic apologist, as you know, yep. did a thorough search. I asked Lutherans who were German, and they said, they, no, no, they, can't, they there's no text. It's just been qualified. But he did say, simul justus et peccator. And he did, uh, he did add the word to Romans 3.28, alone. Oh, yes. Correct. Or a line or sola. Yeah. You know, so the, 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 the passage reads, see how a person is justified by faith and not by works of the law. Yes. Now, the proper way to understand that the works of the law refer to the works of the Jewish cultic law. Correct. Circumcision, the kosher laws, the various ritual laws of ritual purity. They don't justify. It is yeah. Christ who justifies so see how we are saved by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. But you know how Luther responded when people were criticizing him on that. It was rather, well, he he sometimes spoke rather boldly. Um, he, he said, well, if your papist makes such a fuss about the word alone. Tell them Dr. Martin Luther. Tell him that Dr. Martin Luther will have it so Pope and ass are one and the same. Now, I, I've, I've mentioned this to some Lutherans. That, well, well, we don't, we, you know, we don't say Luther was correct about everything. We have to understand him within the con. All right, so we could be charitable, uh, but that's what he said. And also, uh, when it was pointed out that for St. Paul, if you have faith great enough to move mountains, mm -hmm. But do not have love. First Corinthians 13, 2. If I have faith great enough yep. so as to move mountains, but I do not have charity, I am nothing. Yep. And and then a, a, a while back, I, I I contributed to this book, not by scripture alone. Yes. <laughs> pointed some of these things out, you know, that uh, it, and, and then, um, you, you, you know, when this is what Luther said, those theologians who maintain that 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and following shows that faith, in order to be justifying, must be formed and furnished with charity, are, according to Luther, men without understanding, who can see or understand nothing in Paul. These theologians are promoting, quote, a pernicious and pestilent gloss, a most deadly and devilish poison, and in the process, they have not only perverted the words of Paul, but they have also denied Christ and buried all his benefits. Now, that's rather strong language. Very. I, I think, to, to be quite honest, I think Luther is misinterpreting Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, when so when he says, see how a, a person is justified by faith and not by works of the law, he's basically saying, as one Catholic apologist, uh, Dr. Art Sippo, pointed out, he's saying, see how a person is justified by faith in Christ or by being Christian and not by being Jewish. Yeah. That's what, uh, what St. Paul means in Galatians 1 when he says, if anyone preaches to you another gospel, because there was the problem with the Judaizers, those yeah. who said you still had to keep the Jewish cultic law. And so it was a radical break, but... Uh, you know, Judaism was the great preparation for the gospel. Yeah, and yeah. But St. Paul had that, he met our Lord and he realized that it was Christ, the God-man, who provided the acceptable sacrifice. So we have to cling to Christ and, and, and that's important. So I, uh, that how, that's how I would answer that. So are we saved by faith alone? Well, Faith, as, as the Council of Trent said, is the beginning of justification, but it must be completed by hope and love. And, and the Lutherans who signed that joint declaration said, yes, when we say faith, we mean a faith which includes hope and love. So there was substantial agreement on that. But where there was uh, something that needs to be clarified is that uh, at the same time justified and sinner. You, you, you know, the great Spanish Jesuit theologian um, Francisco Suarez yeah. examined that and he said well sin is not more powerful than God so he says uh, either God is unable or unwilling to take away the sin yeah. and he said well uh, neither of these unable or unwilling could be maintained without uh, 
I remember the Latin Signor Magna Stultitia et in pietate, without yeah. great stupidity and impiety. So God doesn't just not consider us uh, any longer sinful, but he renews us. Yeah, amen. He, he changes us by his, the power of his grace. We become living members of his body. You, your point, the one point that you made that was incredibly um, uh, important was in Romans 3.28. You're correct, Luther added that uh, German word alone. And you're also correct that um, there's a very clear distinction between works of the law and good works under right. under the covenant of Christ. There's a massive difference. And um, the Bible makes that very clear, uh, which is all the more confusing when you have Protestants unable to draw that distinction that the condemnation is on the works of the law, not good works under the covenant of Christ. But a, another point that I, I would like to make to the audience um, is that this was a theological novelty of adding the word alone to Romans 3.28. If Romans 3.28 was teaching faith alone theology, Luther would not have had to have added the word alone. And the reason that is so massively important, I want to add for the audience, is that German Bibles before Luther didn't have that German word. They weren't there. I've looked at them the Koberger Bible and multiple other ones that were extant before Luther's translation didn't have them. So Luther was clearly adding to scripture, which really is, is condemned in scripture itself. Um, it should not have been done. It lamentable that, uh, that it was done. Um, and it led to a, a number of problems there, Dr. Fistigi. And I think that today, the one thing that I've noticed that uh, you, you find our Protestant friends uh, having an issue with over and over is they'll see works of the law mm -hmm. uh, and then they will run with it and think that uh, all kinds of good works um, are being uh, tossed in there and that it's faith alone when in context clearly doesn't mean that and I think that that's that's a major issue there I wonder if we will ever be able to get over that hurdle with our evangelical friends well through some good dialogues many evangelicals and Lutherans and even some reformed have come to understand better the Catholic tradition yeah. and of course in the 16th century polemics were at a high point but you know that joint declaration on justification was signed by the World Lutheran Federation but yeah. some very prominent Lutheran groups did not sign on to it. Mm. Uri Synod, the Wisconsin synod of lutherans they're more like hardcore lutherans and kind yeah, of accept yeah. his point and there's still some of these evangelical protestants who want to say there's really no reconciliation between Catholic, yeah. roman catholicism as they call it and the gospel so there's still a lot of that out there uh there's been great progress but also some just have very hardened positions and that really is unfortunate because to not be willing to have fruitful dialogue as a number of these groups have really closed themselves off where they will continue hammering against Catholicism. What I have noticed, Dr. Prestigi, more than anything else, um, are, are a, a, a boatload of misrepresentations of what we really truly believe as Catholics. One particular thing that I hear brought up all the time is that, well, according to Trent, we merit our salvation. And in Philippians 3, 7 and 9, it says that it talks about the righteousness of Christ there, but it then says that we merit our own righteousness. So clearly we are reinventing biblical terms and we are going against the Bible. How would we be able to answer somebody that says, as a Catholic we believe in meriting our own salvation. And clearly Trent was just wrong about this. Well, the, the, the notion of merit has several terms uh, in yeah. Greek and so on. And it's found in, in Matthew and, and, and St. Paul. And, and I mean, uh, it's talking about reward or recompense. Matthew 5, 12 says your reward will be great in heaven. Or Matthew 6, 4, and your father who sees in secret will repay you. 
or Matthew 10, 42. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple, amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. Now, um, and St. Paul says in, in Romans 2, 6, he will repay everyone according to his works. So, I mean, the idea of recompense is there. Now, some uh, Protestants and evangelicals say, well, you're justified, but your good works might be your crown of glory in heaven, that there will be a, a diversity of crowns. That's one way of, of handling it, but uh, it's a very subtle matter about uh, merit. Now, the, the um, Council of Trent tries to be fair to scripture, and I think it's quite accurate in uh, bringing this out, and it actually quotes one of the favorite, you know, the the um, some of the favorite uh, Protestant uh, uh, passages. But like, for example, in chapter eight of the Trent's decree on justification, hmm. and we are said to be justified gratuitously because nothing that precedes justification, neither faith nor works, merits the grace of justification. For if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, as the same apostle says, grace would no longer be grace, Romans eleven six. So Trent was quite aware of that. But we have to also realize that scripture does speak about merit. So I think it's most clearly explained in two sources, if the listeners could just remember these, it's uh, Canon 32 in uh, Trent's uh, uh, final canons in the Decree on Justification. That's mm -hmm. one source, but another source is actually the Catechism of the Catholic Church, yeah. which in uh, 2009 and 2010, uh, and really also 2011, really explains the Catholic notion of merit, you know, okay. and uh, I think 2010 in the Catechism might help us. It says, since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, because grace means a freely given gift, no one can merit the initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. That's a gift from God. Yep. Now, we believe God wishes all to be saved, 1 Timothy 2.4, so he does offer this, but we also have the freedom to refuse it. But then it continues in the Catechism of 2010, moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. Even temporal goods like health and friendship can be a merited can be merited in accordance with God's wisdom. These yep. graces and goods are the object of Christian prayer. Prayer attends to the grace we need for meritorious actions. But then it continues, the charity, this is 2011, the charity of Christ is the source in us of all our merits before God. Grace, by uniting us to Christ in act of love, ensures the supernatural quality of our acts and consequently their merit before God and before men. Now, I think no one said this better than Cardinal Cajitan, Tommaso De Vio, yeah. who was the one who uh, had that dialogue, or we could say interview, well, he was sent by the Pope. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is clear that Luther lo lost his temper on that because oh, he was yeah. to apologize. But then uh, Father Jared Wicks, SJ, wrote a very good book, Luther, well, he, he, he translated some of Luth, uh, Kajitan's responses to this debate. He calls it Kajitan responds, but there's one line in there that's a, a very brilliant on the part of Kajitan. He says, just as St. Paul could say, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. So I can also say, I merit now, not I, but Christ merits in me. Wow. And this is what Trent in Canon 32 brings about so beautifully, I love that image. We become living members of Christ. Yeah, and yeah. so what, what, what really happens then, I'll just read it to you rather than yeah. summarize it, but it, it's very rich Canon 32, which is often taken out of context or attacked or read partially by Protestant polemicists. But it says, if anyone says that the good works of the justified man 
are the gifts of God in such a way that they are not also the good merits of the justified man himself, or that by the good works he performs through the grace of God and the merits of Jesus Christ, of whom he is a living member, cuius vivum membrum est, of whom he is a living member, That's very beautiful, the justified man does not truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and provided he dies in a state of grace, the attainment of this eternal life, as well as an increase of glory, let him be anathema. Yeah. So if we deny that the merit, though it is Christ is the source of merit in us, he lives in us, we are a living member of his body, but it is also our, um, our merit too, by responding yeah. to his grace. And this is because, uh, as, as the catechism says, you know, it's only because God has chosen to associate us with the work of redemption that yeah. we can claim true merit. So in a sense, one sense, it is the merit of Christ, but in the other sense, it is our merit. Just yeah. as we would say in justification, in one sense, it is the justice of Christ, but it is also our own justice yeah. because we are not just considered just, we become just, but we're still dependent upon Christ. So it, 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 these polemics continue, um, unfortunately, some, thanks be to God, some Lutherans and some Reformed and some Evangelicals, they understand the Catholic position better. Yeah. But others still, they still want to maintain those uh, anti-Catholic polemics, and uh, we're still in that situation today. That really is unfortunate as well that we have some that you can clearly tell not only have they not read Trent, they haven't read uh, Trent in its context, they don't understand it, and they don't, they don't understand the early church fathers, Dr. Pasticci, because you're not going to find any early church fathers that were teaching uh, the way the reformers taught on this particular issue. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the great St. Augustine taught very different than than the way Luther taught. And Luther was an Augustinian monk uh, that really, really does say a whole lot. It really does um, uh, open up the, 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 you know, the problems that were evident in Luther's theology. Look, we would have applauded, completely applauded if Luther's idea uh, really would have come down to uh, desiring to reform uh, issues that he perhaps would have seen uh, among the clergy, but it really went above and beyond that to where really weaving uh, his own theology, uh, creating his own theological mindset, uh, that, that, that in and of itself was and is very problematic to this day. Um, the one thing that we, we hear a lot is people will ask, okay, well, uh, in Catholicism, you believe uh, that you need baptism, you need the sacraments, you need all of this stuff to be saved. So does Trent, is Trent uh, a contradiction then when it says that we are saved by grace alone? Are we actually saved by grace alone in the Catholic faith? Or is it really just a way of, as people have been saying, as um, certain individuals have been saying, of just trying to placate the evangelicals by saying, okay, we agree that we're saved by grace alone. Are we actually saved by grace alone in the Catholic faith? Yes, and, and baptism is a sacrament. The yeah. sacraments are outward signs of invisible grace. The sacraments confer grace. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not a human ritual. I've heard I've heard some, uh, some Protestants put it that way. And by the way, Cardinal Müller, who's German, and uh, he... Uh, understands the mindset of Luther well, but he said the greatest break of Lutheranism was over the sacraments, yeah. reducing the sacraments really to two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Yes, well, I, to, 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 that the great break of Lutheranism from Catholicism was losing five out of the seven sacraments. Yeah. And, and that, that was a major break. And uh, then... With Lutheranism, if you say faith alone, and then he still insisted upon infant baptism, yeah. uh, and because he saw it was biblical, uh, or not, and certainly not anti-biblical, and he had some idea of, of baptismal regeneration, 
But if you say faith alone, then why do you need baptism? So soon enough, it leads to an anti-sacramentalism. And, uh, and so uh, I've, I've met evangelical Protestants who want no sacraments, just preaching of the gospel and faith alone. And this is, this is most unfortunate. Um, it's not what Luther really wanted, but as, we, as Hamlet says, uh, you, know, you could be hoisted by your own petard. In other words, you could, you yeah. could get off an explosion and it affects you. So Luther saw this even in his lifetime, the Anabaptists denying baptism, mm -hmm. and he was uh, in polemics with them, and uh, they didn't agree with his interpretation of scripture. And so then Sola Scriptura was, was uh, uh, showing its, its problems. And he, and he said, well, you need the Holy Spirit to interpret scripture. And, but how do you know you have the Holy Spirit? Well, you have the right interpretation of scripture. Well, how do you know you have the right interpretation of scripture? Well, because you agree with Luther. So it yeah. becomes a big circle. And so the problems were, were manifest uh, pretty quickly with the sola scriptura. But you see, with, with regarding justification, I think there, there were uh, some major errors. First mm -hmm. of all, the novelty of this extrinsic forensic justification. Alistair McGrath, who's a church historian, taught, I think he still teaches at Oxford. Yeah. He said this was a theological novum, a novelty um, that, that, that never existed before. Understanding justification as something purely imputed or extrinsic. And then also the denial of free will, which uh, oh, I... Yeah. I've talked with Lutherans. I never heard that before. They often think of Luther as the champion of free will, but they are not, they're unfamiliar with his debate with Erasmus on the servitude of, of, of the will. He called free will a downright lie. Calvin said it was an empty concept in religious matters, free will. So Trent wanted to affirm the reality that we must cooperate with God's grace. Yep. And, and, and that we could we could lose justification. That was another issue. Luther said, well, if you lose faith, you lose justification. But later Calvinists started speaking about the assurance of, of salvation. And Trent was very wary about that because it, it, it quoted passages like 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let the one who thinks he's standing tall, take heed lest he fall. Or Philippians 2, 12, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. These yeah. are scriptures that show that it's possible. Or St. Paul preaching to the Corinthians, uh, uh, saying you were sanctified, you were justified in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's warning them about these sins. And so he has to say in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, I solemnly assure you, no, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor thieves, nor drunkards will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what some of you used to be. Yep. You know, so in other words, we we could only be saved by grace, but we have the freedom to reject grace. Yeah. You know, this, this is uh, St. Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, working together, I pray that you do not receive the grace of God in vain. Now that, that phrase, working together, synerguntes, that's the Eastern Orthodox understanding, synergy, mm -hmm. working together of God's initiative and our free response. And uh, yes, we need grace to give the free response, but we always at least have the freedom to reject grace. You know, and, 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 uh, and the idea in the Synod of Dort of irresistible grace. Mm. And then you, you get into the idea of, well, why does God decide to give grace to some and not the others? Well, then it's God's, you know, uh, decree. It's, it's, it's um, you know, uh, just uh, uh, his predestination, you know, so the, 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 yeah. the total depravity and then unmerited election. God decides yeah. to save one and let all the rest be passed over and be damned. So this denies 1 Timothy 2, 4, that God wishes all of us to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth.
That really is very good point. A number of very good points that you bring up there. Um, and uh, the idea that we can definitely reject the grace of God and we can reject Christ altogether. We, we've seen how uh, there are individuals that have been previously ministers that abandon the faith, become atheists, a number of them prominent ones. They reject the faith. Uh, the idea that they were never truly within the faith would be a ludicrous claim. A number of these individuals I've debated in the past, and they um, they were uh, evangelicals for a long time. So the the, the very the, the reason I bring that up is because it very well you can definitely reject our Lord. Um, you can definitely fall away. That is why I think that in particular um, Romans chapter five is being misrepresented so much. We hear from our Protestant, our evangelical friends. Um, about Romans 5, and I, I, I tend to really, I hear them bring up Romans 5, uh, Dr. Vestigian, and I sometimes wonder uh, if they are reading it in context, in my, in my opinion, they're not. They'll say, well, you know what? We're justified by faith alone. You can't lose this salvation. Otherwise, what kind of peace would we have? Uh, because Romans 5 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God to our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, a problem arises in the fact that nowhere is Roman 5, Romans 5 hinting at anything uh, even remotely similar to faith alone as defined by the reformers. Uh, secondly, it's very clear that without a doubt, you can have peace with our Lord Jesus Christ and you get that peace through the sacraments through clinging close to Holy Mother Church, the pillar and foundation of the truth, to clinging close to the, the church, the teachings of Scripture, the teachings of the fathers. But that peace, uh, that peace can be lost if you don't continue, if you don't strive towards holiness. Would you say that's a correct assessment, Dr. Vesici? Well, absolutely. And it, 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 it comes from just reading the first part of Romans 5, you know, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith to this grace in which we stand and we boast in hope of the glory of God. Yeah. So in other words, we have faith, but also hope. Well, hope is not the same as certitude. See, that all three have, uh, theological virtues have to come together, faith hope and charity, yeah. faith, hope and love. And it says not only that, but we even boast of our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance and endurance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out yeah. into yeah. our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. So we have all three theological virtues in there, first beginning with faith, but then it leads to hope and then we, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the whole question is, you have the, the grace of justification. Can it be lost? <laughs> it's very clear in Scripture that it can be lost. Why would our Lord say those who endure till the end will be saved? No doubt. You know, and so Trent is quite clear on this. It, 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 it tells us, yes, we can have a kind of, of peace you know, because we trust in God's mercy, but uh, there's always that possibility, you know, of of, uh, of 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 losing that that peace. It's in 1534 of of Denzinger, but in Chapter Nine of Trent's Decree, um, that um, it says, "For just as no devout man should doubt God's mercy, Christ's merit, and the power and efficacy of the sacraments." So also, whoever considers himself, his personal weakness and his lack of disposition may fear and tremble about his own grace, yes. since no one can know with a certitude of faith that cannot be subject to error because uh, subject to error that he has obtained God's grace. So in other words, St. Paul, who was so devout, so on fire, said in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 4, I don't even pass judgment on myself. I'm not aware of anything against me, but I do not thereby stand acquitted. The one who judges me is the Lord. Amen. And he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and then manifest the ma motives of our hearts. Now, every time we receive Holy Communion, we have to uh, make 
uh, you know, an examination of conscience that we are in the state of grace. Yeah. So we could have a type of human certitude that we're in the state of grace, but we don't want to be like St. Peter. Everyone else will deny you. I will never deny you. Yeah. So I solemnly assure you before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. So we have to wa watch out for this vain confidence. And uh, now Trent does admit there could be a special private revelation. Yeah. You know, someone uh, being assured that they will be saved. Uh, but even that could be subject to misinterpretation. So private uh, private interpretations can give us a kind of type of certitude, like the Blessed Mother at Fatima telling uh, Lucia, you know, that her her cousins will be will be saved. Yeah. Francisco has to recite many rosaries, but he will be saved. And then the one friend, Amelia, is she's in purgatory. She had died. She's in. But this is still a private revelation. Of course. So, well, we all believe it, uh, or we should. Uh, but uh, this is this is the point. We want to avoid that uh, that uh, that vain confidence that we have to persevere in faith, yep. because even after being justified and baptized, concupiscence remains, yeah. and we have to struggle with it, because uh, step by step, venial sins could become more habitual, and then they could lead to mortal sin, and we break that. So that was one of the great fears or uh, uh, justifiable fears of Trent that the, uh, the Protestants were undermining the whole sacramental and penitential uh, 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 system yeah. of the Catholic Church and not just of the Catholic Church it's established by Christ yeah you, you know Luther wasn't quite sure to what to do with confession um, even in many Lutheran prayer books to this day there's something like the the power of the keys and they had there's a ritual of going to a minister and and uh confessing sins but i've heard from lutherans it's almost never used wow and, you know, it, it, but it's there in some of their prayer books you know so he wasn't quite sure whether that should be considered a sacrament or not mm -hmm. uh, but holy orders that was the priesthood of all the faithful then you yep. undermine the priesthood established by christ and you undermine the sacrament of penance, which was established by Christ. He breathed on the apostles whose sins you shall forgive. They are forgiven them. So it, it's interesting that the Eastern Orthodox, who are apostolic, they they, they kept the sacraments, yeah. all seven mysteries or, or sacraments. But uh, the Protestants broke away from that to the point that some even went beyond Luther and Calvin rejecting even baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's all superfluous. Yeah. What you need is faith in Jesus Christ. Which is really problematic. Of the, you do you do notice that once you get to a, um, a later on down um, uh, past Calvin, you get to uh, a Francis Turretin and, and onward, where really not only is the anti-Catholicism at an, an all-time high, but really you, you, you and I, it pains me to say this, but you notice apostolic teaching and doctrine being dropped, being shed off, almost uh, almost being shaken off, unfortunately. And uh, one thing you do notice is, as history goes on, and we are presently noticing that, is throughout history, these uh, re reformed churches, these Protestant churches in general, have evolved uh, as time goes by, uh, you have the disparaging of purgatory from Luther, which, by the way, his arguments are just so terrible. He even he evinces knowledge uh, that the early church would practice purgatory. Calvin admits that the early church uh, believed in purgatory and practiced it. But you get to the point, Dr. Fastigi, and I know it's um, not the particular topic of today, but so relevant in the fact that how teachings evolve to where you don't find the reformers rejecting much of Mariology, Mary's perpetual virginity of Mary, some even believe in the bodily assumptions, such as that great figures, two incredible figures that they hold in high esteem, Ian Hus, Wycliffe, Luther, who believed in the bodily assumption of Mary. But today, good luck walking into a church of Protestantism where they believe Mary is uh, i.e. Parthenos, ever virgin, 
or where they believe Mary is bodily assumed into heaven, they've shed all of these teachings that even their their founding fathers held. So it really is um, shows you that within Protestantism, the lack of that living and teaching magisterium, the teaching authority that was left by Christ that can only be found in Catholicism, the lack of that really shows a massive problem and massive disunity, doesn't it? Well, it, it does. It does. Uh, my my colleague, uh, Eduardo Echeverria, is a member of this uh, Catholics and Evangelicals together. So he says, are we together? A Roman Catholic answers evangelical Protestants. And I... I you know, I was thinking the most Protestants I meet in scholarly circles, they're quite ecumenical, mm -hmm. but he's responding to uh, some evangelical Protestants such as Francis, Francis Schaeffer, R.C. Sproul, mm -hmm. and more recently, Greg Allison and Leonardo de Carico. Or, uh, and uh, Schaeffer and Sproul claim that Roman Catholics and evangelical Protestants do not share a common cause in the gospel and have hence no alliance in carrying out the missionary mandate of the church. So, I mean, this still exists where they say we're so far apart. And this yeah. is where they bring up Galatians, that Roman Catholicism bring, teaches a, a different gospel. Yeah. Or you have, uh, who is that uh, fellow uh, out in, in, in uh, MacArthur, out in California? Oh yeah, John MacArthur, yeah. You know, vivid, uh, you know, so anti-Catholic, anti-charismatic, Protestant or uh, Pentecostal. So these people, they, 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 they assume a kind of uh, authority which they don't have. Yeah. Um, they pick out certain passages of scripture and go with that and they have a, they have a certain following. This is what uh, uh, Luther saw, the, the problems of that. But I, I think what we have to uh, 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 be aware of, justification or salvation is merited by Christ. It's a gift given to us. Yeah, and through yeah. baptism, we are made anew. Faith, hope, and charity are infused in us. And as we grow older, the sacraments help to deepen that. That's where our good works, uh, first of all, they give glory to God. And uh, as, as the Gospel of Matthew says, but they also increase our justice. They help us grow and sanctify, and yeah. they help others too. So, I mean, the Council of Trent was quite clear. The initial grace is not merited. Otherwise, it would not be grace. Yeah. But what, what is given as a gift um, is this increase of justice before God. That the more and more we, we, we live the gospel, the stronger our walk with the Lord, the holier we become. And, and, and so that, that, that's where, you know, uh, Canon 32, again, you know, that... It, we, that uh, if anyone says that the good works of the justified man are the gifts of God in such a way that they are not also the good merits of the justified man himself, or that by the good works he performs through grace, uh, through the grace of God and the merits of Jesus Christ, of whom he is a living member, member, the justified man does not only truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and provided he dies in the state of grace, the attainment of this eternal life as well as the increase of glory. So if you deny that, anathema sit. So that's yeah. what our good works do. First of all, they're commanded by Christ. Yeah. We're, we're to practice the, the, the uh, you know, the eight beatitudes and obey the commandments. And that's also a case. What, what happens if you don't obey the commandments? Luther had to deal with the antinomians, yeah. those who were opposed to the moral law. And he slipped into this when he wrote to Melanchthon, who was scrupulous. He said, sin but sin boldly, but trust even more strongly. What kind of Christian pastor would be telling someone sin? I mean, go ahead and sin. Horrible. I mean, it's almost mind-blowing. And and that when, when James said faith without works is dead, it has no power to save. Well, Luther in his preface to the New Testament said, well, some script New Testament Scriptures are more evangelical than others. As for James, compared to the others, it's like an epistle of straw. Yeah. And then he did say that. He said, he well, sure there's did. excellent. But this is what then then he could even judge sacred scripture. You know, it, it, it's like some Catholics today. I hate to bring this up, but they they don't like what Vatican II teaches. Now they don't like Vatican I. It's like they could judge councils. They could judge popes. In other words, it's, it's, it's a kind of retro 
it's turning back to a kind of Protestantism. But and you're your own Martin Luther. You're your own Martin Luther. Yeah, with a Catholic uh, uh, aura about it, you know, picking yeah. a certain Catholic devotions and so on, holding those up. Mm -hmm. But your ecclesiology becomes Protestant. You yeah. follow uh, the magisterium when you agree with it. When you don't, you reject it. So, yeah. I mean, that's what Luther, Luther, it came even to scripture. Yes. Since James challenged his theology, it's an epistle of straw. But you you, you, you see, we're, we're, we have to be, give thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ for offering the perfect sacrifice. That, as Trent says, that's our meritorious cause, you know, and baptism is commanded by Christ. It's the, it's the instrumental cause. Now, so without baptism, you know, with, or the desire for it, no one could be saved. So there could be baptism of desire and some people are not baptized through no fault of their own. Jesus died for all, but he commanded baptism. You know, in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This was the will of Christ and the church has continued it from the beginning, baptizing. And you have some, some evangelical, no, baptism is superfluous. You don't need it. So, I mean, I, 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 I'm just trying to be, to be logical and faithful to what our Lord himself taught. He founded a church. He founded the sacraments for our benefit. And we have to give thanks to the two, not only for baptism, but for the Eucharist and the sacrament of penance, which is called the, the second plank uh, after the fall, of, uh, you know, second plank after baptism. If we fall, we could be re renewed and brought back into a living relationship. And yes, saints have developed a kind of uh, confidence and hope, but we have the great virtue of hope where we trust in God's promises, but we have to be careful yeah. of uh, presumption. And I think Trent was right on target to warn about that. Um, you know, otherwise you have, uh, well, the Protestants sometimes deal with this. They say, well, if you fall into sin and you stop believing, that was a sign you weren't really justified, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. You, you know, but then, then it becomes a, uh, you know, irrefutable, you know, well, if you were, if you, if you were truly justified, you'll live a moral life. But some of them don't even say that. Yeah. Some of them say, all you need to do is have faith and uh, do what you, you know, sin, we all sin. It's, it's, I had Dave Hunt, this Catholic, this uh, late Protestant polemicist, yeah. told me no one could follow the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do you follow it? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how could G Jesus, so I said, read the end of that, uh, of that sermon. Mr. Hunt, those yeah, yeah. who hear these words of mine and, and, and the man who hears these words of mine and acts on him is like one who built his house, you know, on rock. Those yeah, who yeah. hear these words of mine and do not act on them. It's like someone who built his house on straw. That's correct. So Jesus does. He's not teaching the Sermon on the Mount saying, no, no one could fulfill this. That's ridiculous. It would not make any sense whatsoever. It uh, really does. Um, make a mess of the message of the gospel and message of what Christ says throughout scripture. Um, I, I want to say, Dr. Fasigi, you've been incredibly clear uh, today in your presentation and answering the objections that we hear from these Protestant individuals. Um, and I think uh, uh, beyond uh, everything, you have uh, shown how Trent's statements uh, very clearly show that the, our ecumenical councils are guided, protected by the Holy Spirit very clearly. And by the way, for people wondering, we've done a great show on ecumenical councils. Go check that one out. But shown how Trent lines up perfectly with Scripture, lines up perfectly with the Fathers. Before we close, Dr. Fasigi, I would like to ask you, uh, if you'd like, put in a plug for anything you may wor be working on. Do you want to point the audience towards something, or do you want to uh, let the audience know what, any kind of project you may be working on? Whatever you have on your mind, my friend, the floor is yours right now. Well, no, I'm I'm uh, part of this group organizing a, a, a really a meeting, mm -hmm. a conference in Rome, where we're going to explore some of the recent questions from certain theologians, some of whom were part of this uh, congress organized by the Pontifical Council for Life under Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia, but uh, trying 
because at least the, the, the press uh, picked out a few of the uh, essays which were problematical. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a conference in December where some very faithful Catholic scholars will get together to reaffirm the church's moral teaching, especially on sexual morality. Wow. You know, so we're, we're responding to the, this book, Etica Theologica della Vita, you know, Scrittura, Tradizione, Sfide, Pratiche. So the theological ethics of life, scripture, tradition, and practical challenges. Wow. Uh, but uh, there's a small group, so just keep that in prayer. I, I, um, we're not, uh, we're, we're doing this really according to the mind of Pope Francis. He said, well, yeah. when he, he said, this is what theologians do. They, they, they bring out hypotheses and so on, but it's up to the church, the magisterium to decide what's, uh, what's good, wrong, right? And what's wrong. Yep. So we trust in the magisterium. That's what I do. I always have. You know, so uh, I was the co-editor of uh, the Denzinger, you know, it, it took like about 10 years of work and someone said, well, what did you get out of that? And I, I didn't expect that question. I said, you know, I learned to trust the magisterium. Yeah. I Without a doubt. Yeah. That, and and I, I, th I think people may also tend to forget that you, know, you uh, I've told people, uh, Dr. Pastigi, you're one of the humblest incredible scholars and i know but people ask me very often they say william you you debate all the time uh you know have you taken any inspiration from anyone and the one thing i've been saying throughout all these years dr Pastigi, in my opinion you are the very best catholic debater i have ever heard you are the best i've been inspired by you uh your debates are the very best you and and i i say that in all honesty uh i would tell anybody that your your presentations have been incredible you're humble to the point where a lot of people don't even know you're also the main driving force behind the new uh, English translation of uh, Ludwig Ox, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. Isn't that correct? Well, yes, I have it here. Well, I mean, people had noticed some very, uh, some mistakes, some mis mistranslations. And, uh, you, you know, I, I don't think I was their choice to do the revision, but I... I worked on it. I mean, I had studied German, but my guardian angel helped me. And in yeah, some yeah. passages, I turned to a colleague, Father McDermott, whose German is st very strong. You know, this uh, Father Ott revised this in 1969, then it was recopied, but there were multiple mistranslations, just looking at the yeah, English. Yeah. And I know French fairly well, so I had a French, I could see the problems there. But then he added and he changed some things and he actually made it more traditional in some parts because the, the 1958 translation was ambiguous on Mary's virginitas in part two that she retained that. a physical virginity. Yeah, and he yeah. said, and, uh, but then this, this makes it very clear. No, this is uh, de fide. It and, is de fide. And, yeah. and part of it, sometimes it's just a little nuance of translation. He said, well, the general teaching you know, that was what the previous uh, uh, German translation had, or English translation, but Algemeine means universal in that yep, context. Yep. But I mean, there were there were mistranslations before, like <laughs> the Holy Spirit is of a similar substance to the Father. Oh, good. Yeah. -like. Well, that, that means consubstantial of the same substance, but it, a like in some German context could mean like, but not in this context. You have to look right. at the Latin behind it, consubstantial. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess my guardian angel helped me, and I found uh, some some really poor translations. Usually, just looking at the English, I say something's fishy here. Then you go back to the original. So I was, again, I believe in guardian angels. I don't know. I do what I can. This is why I trust in the magisterium because I don't trust in myself. I trust in God's grace. Yeah. Because I can trust in myself. Amen. And so we trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust in the powerful intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and Saint Joseph. Uh, the Blessed Mother was given to us as a gift. Uh, and even yeah. Blessed Bartolo Longo, who had once been a Satanist, you know, he converted mm -hmm. and he said the Blessed Mother is you know, almost omnipotent by grace. Yeah omnipotens per gratium, and John Paul II sees the validity in that, that, yeah. uh, that we could, because she's the Lord's mother, her intercessions, her appeals are not going to be ignored. 
Never was it known that anyone who sought thy intercession was left unaided. Now, sometimes our prayers, even to God himself, are not answered the way we want. Correct. <laughs> and in humility, we have to say, God knows better than we do. Always. You know, this is the mystery of divine providence. If I could just mention this, uh, maybe I mentioned it before in your show, but like all of these people are making a big deal of the fact that Pope Francis on several occasions said the diversity of religions is willed by God. Well, my thought is, well, what what is the uh, opposite choice? They're not willed by God, then, then they exist against God's will and he can't stop them, that he's impotent. Yeah. So God permits them, but for his own reasons, sometimes because there's elements of truth and holiness. Did he right. permit the Roman Empire? I mean, he permitted it. Does he? Did he? Per, did he will the the idolatry, the the cruelty? No, but uh, in when when he he meets Pontius Pilate, Pilate says, "Don't you realize I have this authority to crucify you? Uh, you know, to put you." Yeah. He said you would have no authority unless it were given to you from above. So incredible. Even, even God gave the authority to Pontius Pilate in his his, yeah. in his divine providence. And then Romans 3, uh, 13, 4 tells us that the civil government doesn't hold the sword in vain, but it's therefore, you know, God's minister. So the civil authority at that time was the Roman Empire. Did God will the Roman Empire? In his permissive will, he did. He allowed it to exist, yeah. but he was able to even bring good out of the wicked Roman Empire, which wasn't totally wicked. I mean, you know, both of us have some Latin, have Latin descent, so it wasn't, our ancestors were totally corrupt, maybe, right. both, but, um, but in any case, uh, this is, this is where we have to trust in divine providence, which is a deep mystery. God wishes all people to be saved, but yeah. as St. Augustine said, God who created us without us will not justify us without us. In other words, we have freely respond to the grace. Um, now that that right after Trent, there were all those discussions between the Jesuits and the Dominicans, you know, of how to reconcile divine omnipotence with reliance upon grace, with yep. free will, and you had the Molinists and the, the Bagnesians, and then you later had the Congruous with the St. Robert Bellarmine and Francisco Suarez. The, 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 the Magisterium wisely said, Look, you could have different schools of interpretation as long as you agree on the essentials. Correct. When you rely upon God's grace, he's omnipotent, he knows the future, but we also must maintain free will. And uh, if anybody would know uh, the essentials of these teachings, it would be you. Uh, can you perhaps just briefly before we conclude, tell the audience, what is Denzinger? Because Denzinger is a resource I recommend everybody have a copy. In fact, when people ask me, William, what do you recommend I put in my library as a Catholic? I always recommend, look, if you, if you even if you're beginning, if you're not beginning, uh, you got to have fundamentals of Catholic dogma. Uh, you have to have Denzinger, and of course, there are other books as well. But exactly what is Denzinger? That is an essential, is it not, Dr. Prestige? Well, well, Denzinger was a man. He was a priest. He was a seminary uh, professor. And in the middle of the 19th century, he said, my students don't know the sources. So he put together a, a, an Enchiridion, which means a handbook. Yep. You know, uh, well, I, 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 Dr. Anne England Nash and I decided to translate Enchiridion, uh, not as handbook, or the Germans had Handbuch, because we think of a handbook as something like very small. Right. So we use the word uh, compendium. Compendium yeah. would be, it's like a source book bringing together. So uh, Father Denzinger, you know, had the early creeds and then the, the, the key points of ecumenical councils. And then of course he, he, he put together the first sources even before Vatican I. Yeah. yeah. You know, this was like 1854. And then he just, uh, after he was gone, another German took over. So you had Umberg, Bonvert, uh, uh, then you had uh, the numbering, uh, well, uh, Father Rahner, Karl Rahner, was once one of the editors. Yeah. And that was the, 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 the translation by De Ferrari, 1957, was Denzinger Rahner. 
then you had Denziger Schönmetzer. Well, he kind of changed the numbering and took out some sources and added some. That was the one cited in, in Vatican II, Denzinger Schönmetzer. And then his successor was uh, Father Hunermann, who's now, I think, in his early 90s. So he added some. So this it's a source book. And it, it includes the key documents of, of Trent and uh, Vatican I. And most of the key doctrinal uh, uh, sources from Vatican II. Yeah. And then it, it goes up through Pope Benedict the 16th, 2008. Now, maybe the Germans have uh, <laughs> come out with one since then, but uh, this is the one that's uh, uh, out there in England. And what's good now is it's bilingual, well, really yeah. multilingual, because it includes the original text in one column and then the English translation in the other. Uh, and so some of the early ones are in Greek. Yeah. And then you have Latin. Most of them are in Latin. And then uh, beginning around 1611, you have the first vernacular, which is a speech given by the Pope, which is partially in Latin and partially in uh, 17th century Italian. Yeah. So that's the first, uh, the one that I could find that is the vernacular, although Latin was almost spoken. It was spoken in the Roman Curia, or the, uh, certainly. So it, it, it's a very valuable source. There's some things I would like to have seen in it that are not there, um, but that happens with any edited book. My job was not to make the selections, but to find good translations where they did exist, or we recruited people to do the translations. So it's a source book. Um, and it has the councils, popes, and all of that, doesn't it? Yes, uh, key passages of, of major encyclicals uh, yeah. and key passages of the 21 ecumenical councils. Incredible. Dr. Fastigi, thank you so much for your time as usual. What a wealth of knowledge you have been. Uh, incredibly clear. Um, incredibly uh, to the point and knowledgeable. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Vestici. And I look forward to, again, staying in touch, my dear friend, and having you back on in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Vestici. Well, God bless you. And God bless you and your, fa uh, your family, William. Thank so you we just say, glory be to the yes. Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. God bless. God bless you, William. Bye bye.
Hello, everybody. My name is Pat Flynn, and I am here with Kevin Simmons. And we have been asked to provide a case for Catholicism. And we are going to focus in on the miracle of Fatima and why we think this is good evidence for the truth of the Catholic faith, what we might call the Catholic hypothesis. And by the Catholic hypothesis, I mean the core credo beliefs that are within the, the Catholic tradition and one can, that one can find in the Catholic catechism. So Kevin, thank you for joining me for this project. It's a delight to have you here. And it was a little bit providential because I was planning on doing this video. Uh, and it just so happened that you're putting together a course on Fatima. So I figured let's join forces and talk about how Fati Fatima sort of confirms Catholicism in a sense, or at least it, it adds strong support to the Catholic paradigm and worldview. So thanks for thanks for teaming up with me on this, good sir. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's been a while since we were together here on a program, so it's good uh, good to be back with you once more. Yeah. So let's not make any assumptions because I know for William's audience, neither of us no, may. No, be no pun intended, by the way. Yeah. Let's not make yeah. any assumptions. No pun intended. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Yeah, start off with a little humor. It's great. So for those who are not familiar with uh, either myself or Kevin. I am somebody who worked my way out of uh, an atheistic background and got religion, as they say. I'm one of those people who got religion, came fully into the Catholic Church. I'm sort of your classic story of somebody who a little bit of philosophy took me away from religion and faith at a fairly young age. And then as I went deeper, it eventually brought me back. And the short of my story is I really did find that the Catholic worldview made the best sense of a wide range of experience and data that I felt was non-negotiable, that had to, that had to be explained, that had to be accounted for. And many of my many of my considerations, Kevin and gentle listeners, were philosophical considerations that, that converged upon the Catholic faith. And maybe I'll just indicate a few of those here. We're not going to spend most of our time on, on these considerations, but I think it's worth putting them out. And then Kevin, I'll let you give a little bit of your background and story. As I, you know, my my sort of background where I have focused most of my time and education and research is on is in the area of metaphysics and philosophy of religion. And I think when you roll up your sleeves and you, you, you work really hard on philosophy of God and philosophical anthropology, it sets you up with certain expectations. Uh, for one thing, I think good metaphysics leads to a very robust conception of God, of classical theism, of divine simplicity. And as it happens, it's a conception of God that the Catholic Church sort of uh, teaches, dogmatically teaches, in fact. So that's that's a point of convergence I felt was very strongly in favor of the Catholic worldview. Now, there are, of course, Protestants who hold the divine simplicity, so it doesn't like rule out all Protestantism. But for me, it ruled out a lot because there's a lot of Protestants who deny these types of commitments. Another thing that I, I feel was really important, Kevin, was just uh, thinking about human nature and the nature of revelation. You know, humans are rational animals, but we're also rational, social dependent animals that tend towards uh, hierarchy and authority and tradition. So if God's going to reveal something and he's going to will an end, he's always going to sort of will a means that's appropriate to the thing in question for that end. He's always going to work with things according to their nature. I think this is a deep metaphysical truth. So something like the Catholic faith uh, makes a lot of sense philosophically, given human nature, given how God might try to relate or reveal things to us. It makes sense that he would not only work with tradition, but he, and authority, which are, I think, just, again, it, that's just what it means to be human, right? All, all of our epistemology is bound up with tradition and authority. God, it just seems to me, would work with that. However, because revelation is so important, it seems like he would put some fail-safes in, if we could put it that way. Like, something really authoritative, something like a magisterium, indeed, with a chief executive, right? So what I'm saying is just a lot of philosophical, good philosophical background and back work, I think points really strongly, if not decisively, in the direction of the Catholic faith, if there is a true religion and if there is historical data to support it. And then from there, of course, I'm going to argue that the early attestation of sacramentality, the early attestation of apostolic authority, the early attestation of, of, of the papacy, of the papal claims, all this is really well explained, right, by the Catholic hypothesis. Indeed, it's something that you would expect if Catholicism is true. And it's something that I think is really difficult to deal with if you think Catholicism is false. 
there's other uh, things that really convinced me as well. One is just, uh, I think this is sometimes overlooked, is the sheer endurance of the Catholic Church. Even when I was a sort of outsider to religion, it just struck me like, wow, it's really remarkable that most people recognize the Catholic Church is like the oldest institution around, right? Why is this behemoth still here, right? Well, if, if Catholicism is true, the Catholic hypothesis predicts Catholic endurance, right? It predicts that Christ's church will prevail against the gates of hell, that it will not, that it will not go the way of every other sort of bloated bureaucratic institution, right? So Catholic endurance is not surprising if the Catholic hypothesis is true. I would say it's quite surprising, darn surprising, if Catholicism isn't true. So this is what I'm highlighting here is a sort of methodology, an abductive methodology to the inference to the best explanation where certain data points, events, occurrences, experiences, right? If they're sort of better expected on one hypothesis, uh, or here's a way of putting it, right? Um, what is the likelihood that this event or experience or occurrence would occur if this hypothesis were true? And what is the likelihood that it would occur if this hypothesis were not true, either with or without the hypothesis? And so what I've been uh, kind of getting at here is there's a lot of data that I think is just the sort of thing that you would expect if Catholicism is true. It's not the sort of thing you would expect if Catholicism is false. And it was, for me anyways, largely the cumulative force of all this data that really just made it, I think, overwhelmingly clear to me that if I'm going to be a Christian, I just have to be a Catholic. And then, of course, there's other confirmatory signs, such as uh eucharistic miracles we'll talk about those a little bit here as well and fatima so it's not just it wasn't just one thing right many 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 different things all pointing toward the same direction and nothing really pointing away from it at least strongly uh for me i mean every every worldview every paradigm has its anomalies it has its tensions here and there but in terms of where does the overwhelming force of the evidence point and lean it seemed to me, again, as an outsider, trying to just take a, a fair survey of the options within Christianity, uh, the, Catholic, the Catholic hypothesis, it always feels kind of cheeky calling it a hypothesis, right? This was like, <laughs> seemed almost screamingly obvious, right? So that, there's my opening gambit, and that should give people an idea of the type of approach we're going to be advocating here for. And we're going to really focus in on Fatima, actually, because I think this is a really uh, powerful piece of evidence, a really powerful confirmatory sign. But let me let me pause there, Kevin. Let's get some of your relevant background for this conversation, if you don't mind. Sure. And well, anything you uh, want to build on that I just said, by the way. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, when you were talking about uh you know outlet the Catholic Church outliving all these institutions, one I was I just saw the other day uh, an old meme that showed a picture of um one of the symbols of the church and it said the Catholic Church outlasting oppressive government since 33 AD. <laughs> So it was uh, it was one of those things flying around Facebook some years ago, but now it's kind of I don't know it might make a comeback, but but yeah, so it's you know it, we straddle the line here between revelation and philosophy, of course. Um, but when Jesus says you know that he's that the, the church is being he's going to be establishing this church, and uh, you know the gates of hell will not prevail against it, um, you know well then okay well then if the church was established. Uh, at the moment when Christ's side was pierced, that and that's when the fathers of the church say that the church was born was in that moment. Well, you know, then if it, if the gates of hell will not prevail, then we know that the church is going to last. It's going to continue at least until you know Christ comes uh, once more, or once again. So, where is that church? We have if we look at you know historically, if it goes from thirty you know, roughly about thirty three A.D., it would have to. Uh, endure to our day. So the question is, where is it? And how do you identify it? Well, of course, in Catholic theology, that we have all these, you know, put things that like the four marks of the church, one holy Catholic apostolic. Um, but still, uh, we have those sorts of things that are coming into play here. And our focus today is going to be a little bit about how miracles as confirm confirmatory signs, um, or confirmatory signs, I should say. So, you know, we see these happen over time. But before we get into that, you know, as you said, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm 40 years old. I live in North Dakota. Uh, I was born, actually, ironically, I was born and raised in the greater Boston area, though I have long since lost my accent. <laughs> Unless I have to yell or otherwise raise my voice. Uh, 
Then you hear me. Then you hear me about parking the car and all that. Um, but uh, in 1999, I started my college studies. Uh, that was two years after I became Catholic. I became a convert myself you know, at age 15 back in March of 97. So this month will be 25 years. Um, and I was, that's kind of how God got me into the church actually was through miraculous things like apparitions and visions and, you know, things happening with the rosary and things of that nature. That's kind of the, the hook that I like to say that God used to get my attention. So I graduated in high school, 99, went to college to study theology. And I had a background with the classical languages already because of some apologetic work, apologetics work that I was doing at the time. So I wanted to get to know the, the writings of the fathers and the scriptures more, hence the, the classical language background with Greek and Latin. Uh, so that was for four years and then I, uh, 03 and then 03 to 06, uh, I was work, studying for my master's degree also in theology. And since then, I've had, held a variety of jobs from washing, uh, you know, busing tables at a restaurant to my present job uh, working for a Catholic apostolate. But uh, in, on my personal interest still always remains with what the church calls the theology of private revelation. So that's things like miracles, apparitions, visions, locutions, you know, miraculous sorts of things. Um, and related to that are manifestations Things like Eucharistic miracles, um, the stigmata when people claim to have the wounds of Christ on their hands, their feet, and their side, maybe even around their head for the crown of thorns. Uh, demonology is another area that's also of interest because it's all connected. You know, uh, the devil could deceive people with some of these miraculous things, so you have to have some understanding of demonology as well as other areas of theology. Right. Um, which, uh, incidentally, I would say is one of the proofs of the Catholic Church's uh, in, endurance over the years is she's had now 2,000 years to hammer out a lot of this theology, and we have such a richness and a depth to draw from in that great tradition that really does help us through some, through some of these particularly murky times that we're going through, right now, especially right now with the situation over, you know, in, uh, in the Ukraine with Russia there. So, you know, we have this beautiful tradition that gives us that hope. And my understanding is we're going to be going into that a little bit more today, but in a precise thing about with respect to miracles and visions and stuff in Fatima. Right. So since our video is part of a much wider project, I wanted to focus in on something specific. And I think Fatima is a great example because the argument that we're going to be making is that, that Fatima is not surprising. In fact, it's something that we would expect if Catholicism is true. It's not something that we would expect if Catholicism is not true. So we can say it's a a modest C inductive argument. And in fact, there's a really good paper making this argument by Dr. Tyler McNabb, who himself is a convert to Catholicism. Uh, so I'll make sure that that resource is available for people who want to get into some of the, the technical details of how uh, this type of reasoning works. It's really actually uh, um, uh, an, an, an extension of the reasoning used in Richard Swinburne's very famous book, The Existence of God, which I highly recommend for, for really any uh, anybody who's interested in the philosophical uh, case for God in general. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a very sort of um, uh, basic and, and widely used methodology and abductive methodology. We're trying to make an inference for the best explanation. We're not saying that that this evidence like definitively proves with, that we 100% certainty that Catholicism is true. It's just that it's a weight in the scale. And what I want to say, it's a quite significant weight. And it's interesting to hear that part of your backstory, Kevin, where this is sort of what really uh, tip the scales for you. And I want to I want to argue that if somebody is sort of on on the fence, so to speak, it should tip the scales for you as well, because this is a is really powerful evidence, I think, for the truth of the Catholic hypothesis. Now, before we get into that, when we're making these types of comparisons, we, we do have to think about sort of background knowledge. All right. What's 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 already being assumed here? And in this type of conversation, what's, what's already being assumed is that some form of Christianity is true, right? That God exists in some form of Christianity is true. So miracles are on the table. We're not, we're not arguing with, with re, you know, uh, the reductive physicalist here. Miracles are on the table. People in this conversation already believe that there's at least been, you know, the, the core miracles of the sort of mere Christianity. And now we're trying to ask, okay, uh, if we're in the hallway, as C.S. Lewis calls it, of mere Christianity, we do have to pick a door. C.S. Lewis says that. You have to pick a door, right? 
what door should we pick? We're saying that uh, when you look through the history, um, after, of course, the resurrection of our Lord, what we find are uh, a powerful series of confirmatory signs. And in fact, I think this is something of a tradition that needs to be revived because um, Catholic apologists used to be much, uh, much more, I think, um, uh, spirited about presenting confirmatory signs as evidence for the Catholic faith. And that fell away somewhat, I feel like, in the in the past 100 years. But I have to say, is uh, personally, these were uh, uh, very convicting for me. So what I think we need to discuss, Kevin, and what we need to establish are a couple of things here to have this, to make this argument have force for the Catholic hypothesis. One is we have to, we have to at least detail enough of Fatima uh, to show that it is, it is, his, it, it's, it's credible as a truly uh, miraculous event, right? That, there, that, that this, is, this is something that is highly resistant to any sort of naturalistic explanation or being explained away from a naturalistic standpoint. I think, that's, I think that's easily done for anybody who really looks into this case with an open mind, but we're gonna go through some of that right now. But even more than that, I think we have to give enough detail about Fatima to show that this isn't a mere Christianity occurrence, right? That Fatima has the marks of Catholicism all over it, right? That this is a sort of distinctly Catholic miracle that really does, uh, it's like, it's a, it's a divine wink, if you will. Like it's clearly pointing to the truth of the Catholic faith by affirming core Catholic commitments, very traditional Catholic teachings, Catholic devotions, practices, spiritual practices. And in that sense, it's not, and I want to argue, it's not something a Protestant should be comfortable with. This is clearly something that is, is I think, strongly indicative of Catholic truth. And from there, I think uh, once that's realized, as we'll try to establish here, uh, the Protestants kind of stuck in an awkward position. Uh, because if it's, if, if it is the case that there's not a sort of easily available naturalistic explanation here, um, and this has the marks of Catholicism all over it, it seem, it does seem like the Protestant is going to have to, and I've heard many Protestants make this argument, go for uh, really a demonic explanation of Fatima, right? They're, they're really going to have to try and say, okay, yeah, this is not uh, something natural, but it's also not from the good team, <laughs> right? That's how they're going to have to try and, and deal with this. And I've seen Protestants uh, uh, make that move before. In fact, I, that seems to be the typical move that I've seen um, the more philosophically uh, educated Protestants make on Fatima because they see how resistant this is to a naturalistic explanation. So they really have to say that it's some sort of trick of, of the devil. And I think that's a huge bullet to bite for reasons I'm sure we'll get into. So that's my, that's my general framing of where I wanna go with this, Kevin. Anything else you wanna say before we start getting into details? Um, we should probably make say first we begin with what Fatima is for before we get into this more of the specifics <laughs> let's let's do it give us the background that we need to know because we won't, don't want to assume that people are totally familiar so what is this this Fatima thing and why should we think that there uh that this isn't just some like mass hallucination or something like that mm -hmm. Well, uh, Fatima was, is a little town, well, back then at least was a little town in Portugal, about an hour and a half, two hours north of Lisbon in Portugal. And in 1917, between May and uh, October of that year, the Blessed Virgin appeared to three young shepherd children, uh, Lucia dos Santos, uh, and Francisco and Jacinta Marto. Francisco and Jacinta were brother and sister, and both were cousins to Lucia. And uh, like I said, they, 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 the Virgin Mary appeared to them and it issued what uh, some people call like a call or a message uh, calling people to, especially the children, uh, to prayer, repentance, um, you know, sacrificing for sinners, those kinds of praying the rosary. Um, she also had very specific requests for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart the uh, instituting of what she called the communion of reparation of the five first Saturdays, which was a devotion um, uh, rooted in Our Lady. Uh, and then everything, well, then there was some information, very specific information that was that was communicated in July 13th of 1917, known as the, the secret of Fatima. It was uh, one secret in three parts. 
uh, it was very controversial because, you know, you talk about human nature earlier. Well, uh, you know, what was it that Aristotle said at the very beginning of the metaphysica? Uh, you know, all human, nat all human beings by nature desire to know. Well, someone's got a secret. What's the, what, what, what thing is going to get triggered in you, you know? Um, so they definitely kind of got that, but, um, but then everything kind of culminated in what we, in October during the final uh, apparition in that series, that uh, series of six apparitions in this miracle called the miracle of the sun. And that's where the sun moved out way, way out of, of, uh, for what it would normally would in the sky. Uh, some people described it as like dancing uh, in the sky or just, you know, moving around, how, different descriptions. But the idea was the sun was way off of its orbit and axis and everything else. Um, and then at one point, the sun looked like it was coming come crashing into the earth and people were confessing their sins openly. I mean, it was, it was quite the scene. And then the sun went back to its normal place in the sky and suddenly everybody looked around and their clothes were bone dry. It had been downpouring prior to the, prior to this event with the sun. Um, and, you know, the ground and the clothes were everybody, everything was all dry. Um, and different people, as I indicated, saw something differently. Um, some people didn't see anything at all, though, though the few, but still recorded. Um, so there was a big investigation and the church approved uh, these things as from God in October of 1930. And uh, it's been, you know, a story that's been told now for a hundred and going on 105 years. So that's the general backstory. Yeah, if you don't mind, there's a, a couple summary paragraphs in Dr. McNabb's paper that I want to read, and then I want you to fill in any other details you think are important for people to understand before we keep going deeper. How's that sound? Sure. Yeah, I, I just found this a really helpful summary for people who might who might be new. So the miracle of Fatima. In the early 1900s, Christianity in Portugal was predicted to become extinct. Seminaries were closing and very few people were joining the priesthood. Portugal, from a Catholic in Portugal's point of view, needed a major revival. The apparitions of Mary to the children and the miracle that occurred at Fatima helped meet this need. Broken down, there were a total of nine appearances to the three shepherd children involved in the events at Fatima. The first three of which were appearances of the guardian angel of Portugal. Pretty Catholic commitment, right? And the latter six of which were the Virgin Mary. During the three appearances of the guardian angel, the angel encouraged the children to fervently pray to the hearts of Jesus and Mary as the angels offered them the Eucharist. Again, you can see the sort of distinctive marks of Catholicism all over this already. The angel proclaimed to them, take and drink of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by ungrateful men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. Soon afterwards, on May 13th, the Virgin Mary appears to the children for the first time. Mary tells them that she comes from heaven and that she wants to continue to meet them every 13th of each month for six months. During the following month, June 13th, Mary appears again and openly proclaims that one of the shepherd children, Lucia, will soon be alone, meaning the others will die, and that she would have to spread a devotion to her immaculate heart. Again, very Catholic. During the third appearance, word of the Marian appearances had spread, and a some two to 3,000 people gathered at the site where Mary would appear to the children. When Mary appears, she shows the children a vision of hell and calls them once again to establish a devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, obviously, many cr tr uh, Christians are committed to the traditional understanding of hell, but this might be a problem here for Universalist Christians. Right? We seem to be getting uh, a, 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 a strong reaffirmation of again the, the traditional... I was I was I was actually thinking of talking about this as one of our talking points about the truths of Catholicism in relation to hell. Yeah. So I was we'll actually get... I, if we're gonna if that's something we could talk about, we'll, I, we'll I... get there. Yeah. Let me let me get the highlight, and then I want to uh, keep diving into into each of these points. Okay. So continue on from Dr. McNabb's paper. He says the fourth appearance, August the thirteenth, does not go as planned, as the children's civil administrator intervenes and kidnaps the children until August fifteenth. One by one, the civil administrator takes the children into a room and threatens to kill them unless they share a secret, which the children claim the Virgin entrusted with them. All three children, however, consistently keep to their testimony that the Virgin Mary had been appearing to them, thus seemingly vindicating the sincerity of their beliefs. Mary again appears to the children after the incident on the 19th of that month and encourages them again to do penance for the sins of the world. 
the fifth appearance occurs on September the 13th, where Mary proclaims the importance of citing the rosary. The subsequent month, it rained all day prior to the appearance and up until the predicted appearance at noon. Around noon, the raining stopped and the sun came out. Here, most who were at Fatima at the time, roughly 50 to 100,000 people saw something fantastic. The standard story is that the crowd, without pain, looked upon the sun or something that looked like the sun and saw the sun turn multiple colors and, and dance and do all the things that Kevin described. It was widely reported that the sun ended up moving towards the crowd as if it were about to crash. Then right before it appeared like it was going to hit the earth, the sun just returned to normal. There is some disagreement about exactly what happened. For example, some of the witnesses debated whether the sun moved or, and, and some, like Kevin said, did claim some but few claimed that they didn't see anything at all. Regardless, the vast majority agreed that something unexplic inexplicable happened, something unexplainable happened. And it is also widely reported that while the crowds were still staring into the sky, everything, their clothes became completely dry within minutes. Shocked by all of this, the common belief in Fatima was that a real miracle had occurred. And what followed that was a robust revival throughout Portugal. Kevin. Anything else you think is essential to that brief summary of Fatima? No, actually, I didn't realize he had written there. That was actually a pretty good overall uh, overall take on it. <laughs> so uh, the nice thing about this paper, which I'll make sure again is available in, in the resources, is that um, he spends a fair amount of time refuting the, the typical um, proposed possible natural explanations to this. Uh, and I think... Uh, I don't think that that's too difficult to do. I think when you consider all the data that has to be explained, there's really not much of a viable natural explanation, unless it's a natural explanation that's so improbable it would require divine coordination and providence uh, to occur to begin with. So, Kevin, maybe you want to just say a few things about that. Uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does he get into um, how different groups of people that were there, like non-believers and atheists, does he mention that at all in, in the paper? I don't remember if he does, but I, I do remember from my own research on this that a, a number of non-believers converted because of this experience and that the secular newspapers at the time also reported that, yeah, maybe even if they didn't convert them, like something really happened that we don't have an explanation for. Is that correct? Uh, basically, yes, because uh, what they he kind of touches upon, you know, the, 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 the condition of the faith at that time. Well, they had suffered their own revolution. I think it was around 1910. And, um, you know, and Freemasons had taken over and they were in other what they what were called free thinkers of, of the day. Um, and they were trying to destroy the Catholic faith in uh, in Portugal uh, because Portugal was a main bastion in Europe of Catholicism in those times. So hence, it was a target for for these uh, anti clerical uh, groups and societies. So. Um, so what happened was these the secularists free thinkers freemasons uh they were in power basically and when the claims of fatima started with the, with, with from the children uh they were mocking and deriding the children you know it, the, 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 these uh, these misguided souls that were there that were doing this and so when uh the, they talked about the miracle well of course if you're going to claim there's going to be a miracle to verify what you say people are going to show up on mass to to you know either see you glorified or see you have to get taken away in chains you know so that's what they did they were present there um uh scoffers non-believers atheists they all the like were there along with believers and of course when everything happened these people witnessed it and they had i mean they were like yeah, I, I have to admit, I can't deny what I saw, you know, and they wrote about it in, uh, there was one famous article in Osecolo, one of the major newspapers there at the time, um, Avelino de Almeida, I think was his name, um, among other names. But that was actually one of the proofs in and of itself, I would say, is you had this huge manifestation of the supernatural in this miracle of the sun and the subsequent uh, drying of the clothes and uh, and and, uh, and and the dirt and, and the accurate prediction that this would occur prior to yeah. it, which is which is critical, right? We have to be able to explain all this data, not just any one point of it, but all of it. So we have to remember that this was something that was predicted, and it was an accurate prediction from the prior 
uh, experiences that the children had. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And they were they were unlettered children. I mean, they were they were and they were. I don't want to. This sounds because in English it sounds horrible, but because uh, it has the negative connotation. But I mean, basically, from, from today's standards, we would have called the three children country bumpkins. You know, and I don't mean that disrespectfully because you know Jacinto and Francisco are canonized, recognized saints, and uh, Lucy is on her way to being recognized as such. Um, so I don't mean any disrespect. I'm just simply saying they were the children from the hills. You know. They, they they didn't have a high level of education at that time. I mean, none of them even knew how to read or write, really. Um, right. So predicting that there was going to be this major event at this day, at this time, you know, uh, three months, at like three was three, four months in advance. I mean, I, you're either going to be proven right or, or go down in ignominy. You know, there's no other option here. Um, but, you know, it happened. God pr uh, demonstrated it. And I, I think also it, 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 there was a later proof, I think, through the symbolism of it, because uh, some of the predictions involved World War II. Our Lady specified another and worse, if, if, uh, if her requests are not heeded, another and worse war would break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. And, um, well, you know, it, here we are talking about the sun, right? Well, mankind had risen to such a height of 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 uh, pride and arrogance, dare I say, that now we had control over over the bomb, right? The nuclear, you know, nuclear bomb. And what is that kind of based on? Things like the sun, right? Like nuclear fusion and things like that. So in a way, it was almost like I think God kind of showing off, saying, "Aha, yeah, you all think you know what's going on. Well, I'm still I'm still in charge here, you know." And then He does this with the sun to ultimately, I think, in a way, indirectly show. I mean, this is my opinion, of course, but um, uh, I, I think he was doing, in a way, it's symbolic of God trying to, of God telling us indirectly, no, I am the creator, not you. You know, I am the one who commands these things, not you. You know, you participate, but you do not command. You know, um, you are not the Lord, you are a steward. You know, think of kind of like Gandalf when he's engaging with, uh, with Denethor in Lord of the Rings. You know, uh, when Denethor is trying to deny Aragorn to come back and uh, uh, Gandalf says, authority is not given you to deny the return of the king, steward. You know, and Denethor gets all mad and, you know, because he knows his place. Well, that it's like us. We want to rise in pride, but, you know, we've got this wise figure, you know, okay, God, you know, in, in, I guess you could, uh, if you want to make a, an analogy, telling us no, and here's here's your actual place. So I think that's a further sign, but it was very subtle. And that's often how God works, you know, through this big, huge thing, but there's also certain subtlety to it as well. You know, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I, I personally believe that's further confirmatory, confirmation that this is God and the supernatural. Right, yeah. So it, I think that um, one could give a sort of meteorological uh, accounts right, for the particular events at Fatima, like Yaki does, and that's considered in the paper. But that isn't, that isn't a competitive explanation. That's a compatible one, because we have to explain everything forward and backwards from there, including the prediction that this would occur, why such in really an unfathomably improbable occurrence would have happened with all those people there at that particular time, the sincere beliefs of the children having seen Mary and the guardian angel, the prediction and that it did happen when it was predicted to, and then the forward predictions afterwards. I think you just, you have to throw your hands up and say, yes, something beyond the natural is needed to explain what happened at Fatima, if you're being honest about it. Mm -hmm. no, no, exactly. And I, I, I happen to have uh, Father Yaki's books here on the subject. Right. But, uh, yeah. So yeah. So I'm actually giving him a nod. I think I think part of his explanation can be used, but it's not a competitive. It's a compatible one. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Oh no. He, yeah. He's certainly not. Uh, he's not trying to, you know, demystify or anything. He's trying to help us to understand things better. Because the one thing that uh, this is why we we have to make sure that we include when we're talking about the miracle of the sun. It is necessary to include that detail about the drying of the ground and the clothes, because you know, Father Yaki, I mean, and other, basing himself upon other scholars that have gone before him, uh, and there's actually a guy in Portugal, Bernardo Mata, who has done some really good work uh, putting these sources together and explaining 
what the, what their vision of the science behind it was. Um, he's a is a good guy from what anything I could tell. He and I talk every so often, but um, the long and short of it is, you know, Father Yaki and others. They, I mean, that's still unexplainable about the ground. And when I was in visiting Fatima, a friend of mine who used to live there, he has since gone to God, uh, but he 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 took very good great care to remind me that he's like Kevin. You remember you have to emphasize this. He's like that. It, there were two parts to this: the sun itself, but all well, well he said two, but I guess three if you include the prediction itself. But uh, that other part being um, what happened with the ground, because explaining things from a meteorological perspective. Uh, in terms of atmosphere and certain things that might make it plausible to explain how, what, how people saw that, that's all fine and good, but you can't explain three children predicting it in advance and the ground becoming dry along with everybody's clothes. Right. You just can't, be, that, that's not possible in right. terms of meteorological. It, it defies all known laws of <laughs> physics. Yeah, and it's, um, <clears throat> I just want to make a, a quick kind of, I guess, distinction of, of how we, because miracles are sometimes used very broadly, right? And sometimes a miraculous event can just be something that could have a natural explanation, uh, meaning like there's there's nothing that's required to go over and above the natural powers of something for, for an occurrence, but it's just so highly improbable that it would coordinate or result in the event that actually occurs. Uh, think about like the parting of the Red Sea, like maybe there could be, you know, a, a natural explanation to that, but it's so highly improbable that that would have occurred with various winds or whatever at the exact time that it did right when it needed to happen that clearly yeah. even if you don't need anything over and above sort of the powers of nature for that to happen it's just so obvious that this was coordinated by god right through instrumental causality whereas there's other miracles where it's clear that the natural powers are not adequate right that there's something supernatural has to come in and and elevate it right it's over and above and I think it is fair to call both of those miracles, but there is a distinction between the two, right? Where one, you could give a purely, I guess, na yeah, natural explanation of saying, okay, it's within the power of the natural phenomena in question to bring this about. It just is so highly improbable that they would ever do that or coordinate well, in this way, you know, like, apart from providence. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. And I know with the, with the case of Moses and the Israelites in the Red Sea, that there, there's been some talk about how there was a certain area of the Red Sea where uh, like a land bridge can form under the right weather conditions or something. Right. Because yeah, even right. something like cancer, you know, it is possible. I mean, from as it has been explained to me, and I, might, I admit I might be wrong, but, um, you know, right now, all of us have, have have at least a cancer cell in our body. That's how it's been explained to me. But our body has natural defenses to destroy those cells. So, um, so if we have an, a certain natural capacity, presuming that we are healthy, individual, functioning well already, um, there's no disease in us that would that would allow for the for these cells to you know get worse. Then we have a certain mechanism within us already. So if we have a miraculous healing, let's say, of somebody from cancer, you know, uh, it could be God in his, in his grace quickening a natural healing ability. Uh, it could be God, it could be straight up God, you know, removing it. Like I know some people who, um, uh, it's a married couple and it's, it was the wife's father. Uh, he was completely cured of cancer. He went in in an April, I think around 2014 or 2015, I want to say, um, maybe 2016. And he went in in an April. They told him what his diagnosis was. It was wrapping around his spine. He, it, was going, oh, it was on his lung. I mean, he had only so long to live. Well, he told his family for the next two months, they were praying, you know, work, you know, working the beads, as we say, praying the rosary, asking Our Lady's intercession. And all he was doing was taking his normal blood pressure medication. Well, the guy goes back to the doctor for, after, I think it was in June of that year, so about two months later. Mm -hmm. The doctor comes back in, x-rays in hand. He's not noticeably, like, shaken. And he's like, I can't explain this, but you don't have cancer anymore. There's not even scar tissue on your lungs. You know, because cancer is a carcinogenic. So it, 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 there's no scar tissue. How do you explain that? The guy, I think, was in his 70s at the time. How do you explain that in a 70 something year old man? You know, um, you know, it could be God's grace working to remove it entirely and healing it in such a way where he was back to uh, a, a normal condition, 
Yes. Or maybe God accelerating a, a heal, natural healing process. I mean, it is all different. It just depends upon the right. divine. Part, I think part of the problem here is people think that like God and nature are in competition sometimes. And that's, of course, the, the like the completely wrong metaphysical view. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people think that God can't intervene to be violations of the laws of nature. And Herbert McCabe has a good quote on this. He says, look, the reason God can't like inter like violate or intervene isn't because God doesn't have enough power. It's because he has too much, <laughs> right? The only reason that there are natures at all at any given instant is only because of God's causal divine influx, right? So it's totally wrong to think of God who like as, as the entity that sort of flicks this first domino and then this sort of independent thing called nature just takes its course, right? And then maybe God like pokes a finger in here or there. No, God is the live musician uh, who's just improvising all the time. And he can take things in any direction that he wants at any time because everything is always continuously dependent upon the creative activity of God. And so I think there's just a lot of just philosophical confusions, uh, deeper ones that I think uh, cause problems when people are thinking about miracles that don't need to be there and shouldn't be there. Now, I think some miracles are just like of a different class or category than others. Like surely like the resurrection, right, would be different than just like things that we think are just really highly improbable to occur that we'd say, okay, that's miraculous. We really mean that's just like a, a divine wink according to providence or something like that. But the general point is like God and nature are clearly not in competition. There's the divine transcendent causality and then there's the, the natures and the, the agents that he puts in operation right and everything is putty in god in god's hands at the end of the day right well, and, well what's the what's the famous Thomistic expression grace built upon nature you know you, you said god is constantly improvising i'd be a little careful about using that word improvising because you know you're going to have factor in divine providence foreseeing everything in advance but, <laughs> but well i i, I use improvise I, as like I get what you're saying, as yeah. the highest compliment of like who can improvise well well the expert musician nothing nobody's more expert than god and his executive knowledge so yes i understand what you're saying but yeah good point all right so let's let's do this real quick kevin because um uh, i want to get more into the catholic details of fatima uh because again i think that it 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 it, it is highly resistant to any natural explanation and people can uh if they're if they're dubious of that i think a, an independent investigation will will quickly alleviate uh that concern um but my friend timothy mcgrew he focuses in epistemology and he's he's he said a number of things on miracles he actually has the criteria that's helpful for determining when and how we have a sort of a prima facie reason to doubt the miracle claim Right. So let me let me um, list his criteria and then show why I think Fatima easily clears all these hurdles. Right. So his, his first claim is that this would be a reason to doubt the miracle claim. Right. So the, his first one is that the miracles reported only long after it is alleged to occur or at a great distance from where it is alleged to occur. Right. So that's sort of a red flag. Right. Second one. And I'm quoting now, when the report would have been permitted to pass without examination, either because such an examination would have been impossible in the nature of the case, say, with regard to an event that would leave no public traces, or because the local population would have no motive to inquire its truth or falsehood, because, for instance, maybe it fell in with their own prejudices, whatever they are. Three, when no remotely worthy end could have been served if it had really happened, meaning it, it, it answers no deep questions. There's no like religious significance to it. Nothing it speaks nothing about our destiny or origin or morality. No striking teachings are confirmed. No divine uh, commission endorsed anything like that. Now, here's so the I, thing. I, Tim, I, Tim I, God bless him. He's a Protestant. He's a Protestant. But it seems like Fatima easily clears all those hurdles without a doubt go ahead you wanted to say something mm -hmm. yeah i think on that third one that i think what all these really simply saying is what is what would the catholic theologian would say which is if it's dull bland and insipid you know those three words dull bl dull bland and insipid that's kind of like if it if like if it, there's nothing really there's nothing no real meat and potatoes to it right. it's just like i mean like one of the big ones right that, somebody just says oh i just saw a miracle a pink elephant was walking down the street it's like yeah, like, I what, would, what significance would, does that have, right? I mean, maybe it's not dull, but like, what possible, like, it's just, it, it's completely out of the blue. There's no like religious or morally significant context. And it doesn't seem to. No, no, certainly not. You see what I'm saying? You're, you're, 
you're entirely very, very charitable by say, like by going for the philosophical question, what purpose does that serve? My, my first question would be, would be to the person, how much have you had to drink today? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, so, so quickly before we start moving into the Catholic march of Fatima, let's just see how Fatima clears these hurdles. One is Fatima was immediately and enormously well attested. It was subject to massive scrutiny right from the beginning, right? And it has profound religious significance. And as we're about to show, it confirms many of the core Catholic beliefs and issues dire warnings about what will happen if uh, humanity would continue to sin, other further predictions, which Kevin talked about. So I think even by this uh, good criteria that Dr. McGrew lays out, uh, we have no sort of upfront reason to, to doubt Fatima. It is seriously worthy of investigation. And as we investigate deeper, we realize, okay, can't explain this naturally. Looks like we need a supernatural explanation. And then here's where we kind of come to the crux of the issue. If we do accept that this is really something from the good team, as we say, what do we do with all of its Catholicity, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and then it's like, okay, well, then we either have to become Catholic or admit that this like points to the truth of Catholicism, or we have to find an alternative explanation that isn't naturalistic, meaning we're gonna have to look at some sort of demonic explanation. And that seems to me to pretty much kind of squeeze out all the options there unless you can think i'm missing of something kevin no i mean there's a lot there already but the the, the first one that kind of comes to my mind before I, I gotta say it before i forget it but you were talking about it in terms of the criteria there you know it begin like when, when, when it came when it comes to all these things that happen immediately that are testified to it one of the things that oftentimes gets shoved to the side is precisely the suffering that the children went through that's actually an authentication of it, not only because it confirms when Our Lady says, do you, you know, do you wish to offer yourselves to God, you know, but also when they accept it, Sheila said, then you will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort. Um, and that it, it, it was manifestly true throughout the rest of their lives. You can clearly see it in Lucia's writings. Mm -hmm. But the, the fundamental point there being that in terms of Catholic versus Protestant theology, that it, it, it's, it's making suffering worthwhile it, it turns it into something it's not just oh i gotta white knuckle it and grin and bear it because you know jesus said so uh no that's no when we unite ourselves to the sufferings of christ as members of the mystical body suffering takes on a new meaning yes. you know and it for the salvation of ourselves hopefully i certainly hope so but also that of others uh we call that redemptive suffering in catholic theology and so that beautiful point that you mentioned you know, a couple of minutes ago, you know, I, I think it kind of, you know, things about things being attested to right then and there, the suffering of the children. And it, it proves what Our Lady had said. And it happened immediately because uh, nobody believed. I mean, at one point, Lucia's mother took the broomstick to her, you know, and like tries to beat. She's like, basically, like, I'll beat the lives out of you, you know. Uh, I, mean, she, I mean, Lucia suffered an awful lot as right. well as Francisco and Jacinta before their deaths. Um, it confirms what that that aspect. So I want to bring up one other thing that might be a possible objection here, and that are like miracles outside of Christianity. Well, the cool thing here is that the Catholic Church affirms that you know God's grace can operate wherever God wants it to, including you know uh, among our Protestant brothers and sisters. And I, I think it clearly does. I think you have like miraculous healings, right? That we we talked about. Um, but that wouldn't be a problem for the Catholic hypothesis because the Catholic worldview allows for that what would be a problem would be something like this there's an apparition account martin luther appears <laughs> it's on the size of fatima it's as well attested as fatima and there's like deep claims about the pope as the antichrist and the false and the and the and the, and the, and the sort of the, the the deceitful nature of the catholic church if you had something like that then I think Catholics would have a real problem. But as far as I, as far as I've ever been able to tell, there's never been anything like that at all. And the most well-attested miracle claims that are out there, uh, amazingly, amazingly, are just like overwhelmingly Catholic. Uh, so I'll just give um, a quick uh, idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, just not too long ago, Kevin, I did a, just a little Google search, um, and I just I just Googled the best evidenced miracles within Christianity. And immediately I got an article from history.co.uk, um, right? So I just clicked like the first Google thing that came up. And I, I said to myself, like, I'm willing to bet that almost all of these, if not most of these, would be like pretty Catholic miracles. And as it, ha as it turns out, I was right. Four out of the five on that site 
for like distinctly Catholic miracles, Lourdes, Fatima, Padre Pio, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And the only exception was the, this Orthodox Christian woman who I had never heard of before, Vesna Hulavik, who was, have you heard of her? She's the, she's the person who, who survived the highest fall of all time from an airplane, right? So like, seems actually pretty oh, miraculous. Was she landed on her face? Some, some, something, but she and fell out of an airplane over the way you're six weeks pregnant from an attack. But there's nothing about that claim that is like anti-Catholic or confirmatory of another denomination. So I don't think that that one's a concern. But I, but it's funny because I had myself. I did a little hypothesis testing. I said, I bet if I type this in, the best evidence miracles will be will be Catholic, and they, <laughs> and they were. And then I clicked the next one, which was from LiveScience.com. I'll make sure these resources are available. And again, what did I find? Another laundry list of peculiarly Catholic miracles, uh, including not just Marian apparitions, crying Marian statues, bleeding Eucharistic hosts, dead saints whose bodies refused to decay. None were peculiarly Protestant. Virtually all were peculiarly Catholic. What does that tell you? Well, this is just the sorts of things we would expect if Catholicism is true, not at all the sorts of things we would expect if Catholicism is false. And in fact, if I were to see sort of miracles outside of Catholicism, if Catholicism were true, I would not expect like Martin Luther to appear and big apparitions that make anti-papal <laughs> claims. Um, if Catholicism were true, I might expect that, right? But what do we see? We don't, we don't see those scenarios. We see scenarios that always, or for the most part, point back to the Catholic faith at least among the most well-attested miracle accounts we have. And I just like, how can people ignore this stuff, man? Like, it just seems so, especially when you add them all up, it seems so glaringly obvious. So sorry, that's a, a bit of an aside, but to me, it was really powerful when I was looking at sort of an outsider and looking and looking at miracle claims with, with honest scrutiny. So Kevin, let's, let's just, we kind of hit the highlights already, but when you, you're obviously somebody who spent a lot more time thinking about Fatima than I have. You have a book on it, which we'll mention at the end in your upcoming course. But what about Fatima to you do you think is so distinctly Catholic, right? Um, give us some of the, some of your deeper thoughts there. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, where do you begin? Um, well, Fatima has always struck me, uh, but it wasn't until more recently, or particularly during the research for, for my book, um, that it, it kind of went a little more deeper with it. And I think one of the most fundamental things that I could point to is, you know, a lot of people want to see is, is the extraordinary things. I find that God often is more powerful in the small things, that it's much, it's much more profound, kind of like, again, if I may make an analogy again to Lord of the Rings, you know, when Gandalf is talking, I think it's a Frodo and he's talking about how, you know, it's the small people, like it's the, it's the everyday acts of kindness that, that keep evil at bay, you know, it's kind of something similar, you know, it, God reveals himself, not always in this big, huge, flashy, showy way, but also in the very simple and the subtle. And the way Fatima was described by one writer, I, I'm drawing a blank as to who it was at the moment, but, uh, was that Fatima was an explosion of the supernatural in our world. And here we are now 105 years later, or just shy of 105 years, and we're still picking up the pieces of this. And so this explosion of the supernatural, people are still trying to figure it out, figure it all out. There's been a lot of blessings, a lot of controversy too. Uh, a lot of ink has been spilled over some controversial aspects. Um, that's what my book is actually primarily primarily addressing is one of those controversial mm -hmm. aspects. Um, but I find that it's also so simple, the message of Fatima, that I think we overly complicate it as human beings. Right. And that and it bespeaks the divine wisdom when you're studying it in depth, when you're reading what Lucia wrote about it, um, you can just see this thread all throughout. And that, for me at least, is one of the big, very, somewhat contradictory example, but you know, glaring signs that this is that this is God talking because it, this is God acting because it doesn't. I mean, granted, we had this big, huge thing in the miracle of the sun, but there's a lot more to it than just that. And God, God speaks through these events, even now, very powerfully, 
and so that for me is one of the big signs um that uh, just that, that kind of shows that like this that this is a, like one of those supernatural character marks you know if we have a checklist of things you know uh if it's dull bland and insipid like we mentioned earlier well you know just crump it up the waste and throw it in the waste can but if there's something that actually is deeper I, I, I'm going to use the word tantalizing, but not in a goading way, but it draws you closer to God, yes. like, like, in a, like in a romance, you know, it's not like a tease. It's just, no, you've caught sight of the, the beloved and, you know, you, you just, you're, you gravitate towards that. That's what I find, especially in the message of Fatima. And that's going to be important because if somebody wants to try and say that this was a trick of the devil, they're going to have to deal with all the good fruit. And I think, you know, that's that's one of the ways you you really probably the only way at the end of the day you can make these types of uh, assessments, right, is what is the fruit that comes out of something like this. And it's been enormous. It's been enormous. Like you said, it has drawn many, 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 who knows how many people at this point, right? Uh, since it first occurred, uh, into the cap of faith, into a much deeper relationship with God and Jesus, rather than a way that I think that that's too much of a cost to bear in terms of an alternative explanation. I think, I mean, the Protestant would have to say that, and some of them might be willing to say that all the conversions to the Catholic faith are themselves just so evil, <laughs> right? That, that, right? But most Protestants don't want to say that these days. I mean, most Protestants are far more ecumenical. The ones that I've talked to, they don't think that all Catholics go to hell or something like that. They might think that the Catholic faith is mistaken, but that Catholics at least can still be saved and stuff like that. So most Catholic, uh, most Protestants these days that I've talked to, I don't think would want to say that the devil just brought everyone into the Catholic Church as that 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 you know, was gullible enough to believe in Fatima so that they would they would be damned. That just seems like far too ridiculous to uh, be taken seriously. But uh, yeah. I, I, you, again, you and I might have different experiences, but, you know, sometimes I see the comments and comment features on various websites, political or religious websites. I don't know. Sometimes I, I, I there are people who really get I mean, quite frankly, nasty and vicious towards us Catholics. And I'm just kind of like, Hold the phone, people. Calm down. You know, um, I actually man, just the other day, and maybe it's maybe I, I say this because I just actually saw it. What was it? Yeah, Friday, within like yesterday or Friday, mm -hmm. I just saw it in some of the com boxes on a on a political website because uh, the topic of religion. Got, actually, it was a topic on Fatima. It got brought up on a political website with uh, with Steve Bannon, and there was another news outlet covering it. And I, I saw the comments underneath, and I was just kind of like, "Oh my goodness!" Yeah, and, yeah, right. And, and I, I'm, I'm actually sad, and, grieved, and, grieved me. And of course, Catholics can can be nasty too, right? But I'm 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 talking about those who who aren't aren't the internet trolls, right? And um, and it does seem to me that that when you look at Fatima, it has brought enormous fruit in terms of repentance, in terms of conversion, all the things that you would expect if this is from the good team. Not at all the types of things you would expect if it's not from the good team. And that's why I think the sort of alternative explanation of, of pointing towards demonic activity is just, um, it's an untenable one. Now, let me read two paragraphs from Dr. McNabb from his paper that I think summarize well, what, yeah, if you want to chime in first, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 just, yeah just, just real quick. Um, one thing that needs to be put into, into focus is, is that in the church's theology of private revelation, um, this was outlined by Pius, Pope St. Pius X in his encyclical Pascendi Dominici Gregis when he's talking about what he calls pious traditions, of which things like apparitions and visions kind of they come under that heading. You know, he, he, he reminds everybody that, you know, there's no lack of human want for arguing over these over these matters. And that's why in the long run, they are considered they're not considered to be you covered this earlier. They're not considered to be definitive. Right. But they're more like ancil anc ancillary or like helpful um, uh, proofs to back up the the, the primary things. Yeah. Yeah. And so basically that's what Pius would, would I think Pius X would have agreed there too. But I just wanted to point that out because I, maybe somebody might watch and might be saying, well, what about this? What about that? You know, what if it is the devil? You know, and this is where we go back and forth in that argument. Pius points this out. And that's why um, when the church approves something, you know, there's not the mark of infallibility to it. It's simply saying that 
this appears by all indications to be from God, and it is a help that God seems to be uh, giving us in a particular moment, a difficult and, moment. And you are free to assent to it. You are, we are free, un, under, and there's no pain of sin. Um, if somebody, like if I don't do, let's say, the five first Saturdays, uh, I have, by the way, don't get me wrong. Uh, the first five was just yesterday, actually. But, but um, you know, if, if you don't do it, it's not like you're going to go to hell for not doing that. You know, we go to hell for, you know, committing mortal sin or, you know, or doing other terrible things, but not because you yeah, didn't but, do that. Yeah, but Catholics are not bound to accept Fatima, right? Um, is what is what you're saying. So good. All right, let me read these two final paragraphs and we'll get some closing thoughts. I think this just summarizes the case really well, uh, as Dr. McNabb puts it. First, given our evidence, the content of the Marian message and the angels uh, message possess unique elements to the Roman Catholic tradition. These elements include consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to praying the rosary. With respect to one, the consecration to the Immaculate Heart Mary is seen as a specific dedication to the intercession of Mary, where one attaches oneself to Jesus more fully through Mary's intercessory prayer. Although this works nicely with the Marian thesis on our background knowledge, nevertheless, this particular form of dedication to Marian intercession has been uniquely observed by the Roman Catholic tradition for many centuries. With respect to praying the rosary, the rosary consists of a set of prayers that is uniquely Roman Catholic, and it has been both said in the Roman Catholic tradition for ages, and it conveys what would become the uniquely defined Roman Catholic dogma of the Assumption of Mary. So we can't forget about that aspect as well. Second, we should expect that this is, he brings up the Martin Luther thing. Second, we should expect that if a, if a figure who represents a specific Christian tradition appears, then it would give credence, meaning it should raise our confidence, to the truth of that tradition, assuming the figure does not denounce that tradition. For instance, if Martin Luther appeared with a message from God, then many would consider this to be evidence that the Protestant tradition is correct over the Roman Catholic tradition. Or if John Calvin showed up with a message from God, then this would serve as evidence that the Reformed Protestant tradition is correct over other Protestant traditions and the Roman Catholic one as well. Likewise, the fact that God chose Mary to reveal his message in a Roman Catholic context, that is a context where heavy Marian devotion is both common and seen as biblical, gives us evidence that the Roman Catholic tradition is correct. I'm very moved by this by this evidence. And Fatima is very moving to me. It just seems so clear. So it seemed like such an obvious divine wink uh, that, I, that I wanted to share uh, my personal reflections, Dr. Matt, McNabb's paper and the insights of Kevin here for everyone to seriously consider this. And also to consider that the cumulative case, the cumulative force, not just of all the biblical data and the, the data from the church fathers uh, and the philosophical background we talk about, uh, but all the sort of confirmatory signs down through history, the apparitions, the Eucharistic miracles, the holy lives of saints, the non-decaying bodies of saints, all of it, and just ask, what is the best way to explain all this? And so far as I can tell, there is no better way than just admitting that the Catholic hypothesis is true. So those would be my final thoughts on the matter, Kevin. What else would you want to say about this? What else do you want to leave people with? And then let's make sure that we mention some of your upcoming projects as well. All right. Well, I'm not sure how to, like, we'll be like closing thoughts. So I'll just kind of go, you know, from the heart here uh, briefly. But, um, you know, as I said earlier, what interests me with Fatima is, as a, a number of things, but among it just being the simplicity of the message and the heart of it is going back to the basics, you know, but specifically when God offers through his mother, this devotion to her immaculate heart, you know, our lady says it will be the pathway that will lead uh, the children, but also by extension, those who practice the devotion to God. And I think it's very, it, it's so simple again, because if it, this, this goes back to the Marian dogmas of the Immaculate Conception, in particular, of the Immaculate Conception, uh, being without sin. And so if she was without sin and full of grace, she fully reflects God. And so if we are called to imitate her Immaculate Heart, then that's living the Beatitude, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God, you know. And as mankind was going away from God with all that secularism, materialism, and communism, and atheism, God is offering us the path of his mother's immaculate heart, which is 
a straight shot to him because of her purity and her grace, you know, given to her by God, of course, not by her own merit, but still it's in place. And so when we follow that path, it, it, it's, again, the simplicity of it, you know, and people would gradually or wholeheartedly convert uh, as they begin to live this. And that's something I just want to leave with people is having that devotion and really what that means. It's an underrated aspect of the message of Fatima. And when we, and as we're living it, we begin to develop that interior attitude of the Blessed Mother. And it fulfills kind of what St. Louis de Montfort talked about on the subject and his true devotion to Mary. And as such, when we're living it, we are witnesses to the, we are, to the love of God. Yeah. which in and of yeah. itself is attractive and draws people, which is necessary in our times. So that's why it all just kind of comes together. All the, it's like, the, it's like a zipper, you know, everything just was falling into place, you know, with Fatima. Yeah. And that's why it's like, okay, you, you have to know that this is God because everything just comes into place, you know, yeah. um, yeah. that's yeah. be some closing thoughts I would I wish to yeah. offer for the Be audience. Beautiful reflection. So let's, let's finish up now. I will make sure that William, uh, lists all the resources for the gentle listener to dive into. There's been a number of sources that I've been inspired by and borrowing from throughout this brief conversation, going all the way back to Richard Swinburne and how he makes his cumulative case uh, apologetic. Uh, Dr. McNabb's excellent artic article on Fatima as a C inductive argument uh, for the Catholic faith. We mentioned Father Yaki and his work. I also want to mention uh, Father Spitzer has done a fair amount of work on uh, the veracity of Fatima as well. So we'll make sure all those resources included. If uh, you want to check out what I'm doing, uh, you can come over to Philosophy for the People on YouTube. So I host a philosophy YouTube channel with my friend, uh, Dr. Jim Madden. Uh, and we're always kind of looking through a Catholic lens, but exploring the great philosophical ideas. And we do a fair amount of apologetic work over there as well, especially on the sort of theism, atheism debates. So that's what I'm up to. You can check me out at uh, philosophy for the people on YouTube or philosophyforthepeople.com. Kevin, I know you're you have a book on Fatima and a course you're working on. So why don't you mention those quickly? Sure. Uh, I have a book that came out in 2017 called On the Third Part of the Secret of Fatima. Earlier I mentioned there was the secret in three parts, and that there was some mystery to it. And the third part was one of the biggest mysteries of all. And there's been some controversy surrounding it earlier that I kind of touched upon lightly earlier. So this book is getting into those controversies and discussing them and trying to show where some of those areas were a bit uh, mistaken, respectfully speaking, they're mistaken, but still. Um, and then uh, on March 14th, I'm going to be, I'm kickstarting a uh, course based upon my book uh, to, it's, a, it's, it's called the MOOC, a massive open online course. It's open to anybody. Um, and just talking about these issues and getting, helping people to understand better what happened with this, controversial aspect of Fatima, but also get to know the message and the greater call of Our Lady at Fatima. So those were, uh, and those, you'll find information about that on my website if anybody's interested. It's uh, it's just www.kevinsimmons.com. So just my first and last name.com. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And we hope that you found this video helpful.
Hey everyone, this is Eric Ibarra. I am here to give a presentation in the form of a rebuttal to a Protestant apologist whose name is Dr. Edward Dalcor. He uh, gave a presentation himself on a YouTube channel called M2M Network, Ministry to Muslims, which could also be viewed at Anthony Rogers' YouTube channel posted on January 31st, 2022. His presentation was on the crumbling rock of Romanism. And his basic intention was uh, to give a short clip uh, listing reasons for why Catholicism is wrong and according to history and according to scripture. So I'll be presenting um, a rebuttal here, and uh, this is my first slide. This is going to be a PowerPoint, and I'll be here in the little square at the bottom left or right, depending on which uh, side this ends up coming up on the viewer end. But uh, let's get on with it. So the first thing that I should address here is that at at the at the at the time that Dr. Dalcor was given to present, which was later than uh, the other presenters, it was basically like a four-hour presentation or a three-hour presentation, and uh, different speakers came in at different times. So Dr. Dalcor came around like after the first hour. So if you see me reference a time mark here, that's far into the video. That's not. In that's not the same amount of time into his presentation. Um, it's ju it's it's just that he came in later in the video um, as they were switching speakers. So I'll begin with a uh, time marker one hour nine minutes, where Doctor Dalcor begins to speak about um, the ex cathedra teaching ministry of the Pope, and how if this were to be um, Basically, how how would the ex cathedra teaching of the Catholic Church be proven wrong? Well, it would be proven wrong by a pope uh, teaching an, an error in the form of his ex cathedra modality of teaching, and uh, he proceeds to to make an a, make a, an argument from two cases uh, in in the uh, list of of popes in the past where this has happened. Um, so I, I first want to define what ex cathedra means so that way we're clear and we can test uh, Dr. Delcor's uh, argument. So what is ex cathedra? It literally means from the chair. And we'll get the definition from the First Vatican Council because there's no better place. Uh, the First Vatican Council, 1870, it defines ex cathedra in the following way. We teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that when the Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. So, now that we have that defined, if a pope were to err in faith or morals when he fulfills said conditions, this would certainly be a falsification event of the doctrine of papal infallibility and therefore Catholicism. The question is, has this happened? But let me just rehearse here what this ex cathedra teaching ministry is. Number one, he has to be in a certain exercise, right? If you look on screen here, it says that is when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians. So if you were to come in uh, on, the, on a, a small consistory meeting between popes and cardinals, and in that meeting, the pope, speaks strongly about uh, there being a definitive status to a certain teaching. And it was caught on camera. 
and it was broadcasted for the world to see, for example. That would, that would not be an ex cathedra statement because that exercise that he's doing there in the meeting with the cardinals is not this kind of exercise, which is the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians. So there has to be an address to the universal church. And then it adds in virtue. So it's an exercise of, of his office, his universal office, and with a certain virtue that, uh, that, that modifies the exercise and describes the exercise. And that is in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority. So it has to come with a certain mode this intention to uh, to bind the universal church. And then it gives the uh, what it is exactly that has to be going on here formally. He defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. So there has to be a definition of a teaching, a doctrine concerning either faith or morals. And it has to be um, very clear that he intends the uh, whole church to hold to this um, as a matter of faith. So now that we have that refined definition uh, given to us, we can move on to one of the popes in history that Dr. Delcor claims that this has happened. Dr. Delcor says that Pope Honorius was a very heretical pope and says that he taught heresy ex cathedra. Is that so? Uh, I want to be fair to Dr. Del Cor because he doesn't quite exactly say that Honorius um, taught an error in his in the pope's ex cathedra modality of teaching, um, but he definitely in, uh, insinuates that it seems to me. Um, but I want to be fair to him in case that he, he did not mean that. So allow this to be first and foremost a, a clarification. So uh, Pope Honorius wrote two letters addressed to the Patriarch of Constantinople, whose name at the time was Sergius. And there was a controversy going on in the 7th century, um, a debate about uh, Christ our Lord and whether there is in his activities uh, two or one, if there's two energies or two activities or one energy or one activity in the uh, in the willing of, of our Lord. And so and that ended up culminating in a debate on whether there's two wills or one will in Christ. And uh, Pope Honorius wrote two letters and in, in, in the midst of those writings, uh, Honorius did say that he believed that Christ had one will. However, it's very debatable on whether he had any heretical intention or even if he made a mistake um, or an error. Uh, many scholars today look at those letters and, and don't really find um, that there is a clear endorsement of what would later become in Constantinople the doctrine of uh, monothelitism. That is one will, mono one, thelema, monothelitism, meaning the doctrine of one will in Christ. Uh, even in his own day, uh, Pope Honorius was defended uh, by his uh, successor, Pope John IV, uh, who taught that that's not what Honorius meant. He meant simply that there's no competing wills that oppose each other in Christ. Uh, and he used as the uh, comparative paradigm uh, Paul's uh, teaching in Romans 7 of how you have the, the mind that wants to do good. And then you have the body or the sinful, the body of sin or the sin in the body. Um, he personifies sin as kind of an opposing figure that creates tension within the human being. And uh, Honorius was... Uh, intent on avoiding coming to that conclusion about our Lord because our Lord is sinless. And so it's very doubt, it, it's very, it, it's still open to dispute um, as to what Honorius actually meant. But even if we were to uh, just go ahead and settle it for the sake of argument that he did teach 
that our Lord had one will in the sense, in, in the erroneous sense that the uh, Byzantines um, and further Eastern for folks were intending to mean, um, he still only wrote these letters to Sergius of Constantinople. And so according to the ex-cathedra definition that we just gave, um, that would not have been an exercise of his office as universal shepherd and universal teacher teacher in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority um, with the intention of defining a doctrine um, per se uh, as binding upon all Christians. And so uh, this would not be a falsification event, even if Honorius did um, espouse errors in the, in the realm of doctrine here. So this fails the condition of universality and the intent to dogmatize. And so we can kind of set aside the issue of Honorius um, if we're going to be fair to the teachings of the Catholic Church. I understand that those out there who don't accept the, the conditions and the distinctions and the nuance that the Catholic Church gives about um, the various uh, conditions and modes of authority and papal teaching and the papal magisterium. Um, but you, if you want to, if you want to deconstruct and uh, refute Catholicism, it's best to be fair with what the Catholic Church teaches, rather than um, go outside of what it teaches in order to try and show an inconsistency or an incoherence. So, for the sake of fairness, let's just be fair and and admit that uh, Honorius's uh, so-called erroneous letters to Sergius would not have would not have been an ex cathedra mode of, of papal teaching. Uh, then Dr. Delcor mentions how Pope Benedict the Ninth, uh, who was a disgrace to the papal office, disproves Catholicism because of his immoral lifestyle. This is at uh, time mark one hour thirteen minutes ten seconds. But this can quickly be set aside because the fallen condition of mankind is not obliterated by one's occupation of Peter's chair. And so nothing in this accusation confronts what Catholicism teaches about the papacy. Okay, so this is just a call to fairness again. Um, it, you know, in an evangelical megachurch or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church, um, if a particular minister uh, is proven to be, uh, you know, unrighteous or secretly immoral or even publicly Im uh, immoral, and, uh, you know, there's not enough evidence to really indict him or um, the, the leadership at that church does very poorly in handling the situation and it could last for a number of years uh, as a scandal. This would not somehow, for Protestants, obliterate the divine foundation of the office of the, of the elder or the presbyterate. Um, as the New Testament teaches in the Pauline letters, you have an office of bishop or the elder and also the office of deacon. Um, so Protestants are not going to say that an immoral deacon or an immoral pastor, uh, even stretched out to whatever degree, um, puts away this whole office completely as if it were a non-reality. So in the same way in, in Catholic teaching, um, obviously, the the high calling of the a papal office is um, it would definitely be anti, it, it, it's it's you know it calls for a holy life, um, it, and it calls for you know uh, to be a to be above reproach, like the New Testament says. Uh, but unfortunately, that just doesn't always happen, and when it doesn't happen, nobody concludes whether they're Catholic, Eastern Orthodox. Um, Anglican, Presbyterian, Lutheran, or even within the evangelical world, um, none of that sinfulness of man uh, obliterates the Pauline, or, you know, the New Testament teaching on the pastoral office. And so we would just um, we would just take the same kind of concept of the uh, irreducibility of the papal office, uh, despite the sins of some of the occupants. So we could quickly set that aside. Then uh, Dr. Dalcor moves into what is the bulk of his video uh, opposing uh, the Catholic Church, and that is with 
his claim that the majority of the church fathers are opposed to the Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16, 18. As uh, many of the listeners here know, and, and for those who are listening and do not know, the Catholic Church uh, uses, uh, has famously used three passages in Scripture in order to show the uh, New Testament origin of the papal office, and that is in certain commissions that Jesus gave to, to the Apostle Peter in Matthew, Luke, and John. We call that the Matthean, Lucan, and the Johannine commissions from Christ to St. Peter. And the most famous one is Matthew 16. And um, Dr. Delcor is, is, is very aware that the Catholic Church is very dependent and sensitive to what the tradition of the church claims on scriptural interpretation. And so in his understanding, the Catholic Church fails this test because the church fathers, the overwhelming majority of the church fathers, in his view, um, and in particular, the most important church fathers, um, all contradict the Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16 and actually offers a an opposing interpretation of Matthew 16. So this is where he moves into, but as he begins, uh, he brings a witness um, to the game. Um, you can call this a, a hostile witness. Uh, he brings in the late Archbishop of St. Louis, uh, Missouri, named Peter Richard Kenrick. He lived from 1806 to 1896. Uh, he was a, a participating bishop at the First Vatican Council in 1870. Uh, Kenrick himself admitted he was of the minority, um, and so Dr. Delcor uh, mentions how Kenrick was uh, in some sort of opposition to the doctrine of papal infallibility at the council. And uh, he, it needs to be known that he did uh, conduct a study on the church fathers on Matthew 16, as well as the uh, Lucan and the Johannine Commission. And uh, he did conclude that, the, the, what, from what he could tell, the majority of the church fathers understood that uh, the rock, uh, Petra, in Matthew 16, is not uh, Peter the man, but uh, the faith, the confession of faith that Peter gives. Um, and so he does, he did offer that opinion at the council. However, it needs to be known that he also later came around to agreeing with the majority, which was in acceptance of the first dogmatic constitution of the church, Pastor Eternus or Eternal Shepherd. So uh, there's not a lot of leverage to be gained from Kenrick because uh, there was, there, there was, a great deal of open space for the bishops to uh, debate this the, the matter. Um, you had a number of pamphlets going back and forth during the the sessions of the council with people giving opposing views. Um, of course, there's been historians who have have liked to talk about the uh, lack of liberty at the council. But uh, if you read some of the monographs on this council. There were uh, um, there were debates, uh, fierce debates, during the council, before the council, and even after the council. Um, but when when Kenrick returned to the United States uh, after the council, he continued to serve for nearly thirty years as a Catholic bishop. Um, so what Doctor Delcor is trying to do here is he's trying to take a hostile witness, somebody who is not a Protestant, somebody who's a Catholic, a convinced Catholic, uh, who conducts his research of the fathers and comes out saying that Matthew 16 doesn't support the Catholic Church. But um, it has to be understood that um, Kenrick's view was highly nuanced. Um, if one reads the speech of Kenrick uh, that is published in an inside view of the Vatican Council in the speech of the most reverend Archbishop, Archbishop Kenrick, uh, published by the American Tract Society in 1872, uh, it becomes clear that Kenrick himself unreservedly held to the divine institution of the papacy and that Peter and his successors are the unique ministerial primates of the church's government. 
However, he denied that this could be proven from the bare text of Matthew 16, 18 itself, in light of the diversity of interpretation among the fathers. Nevertheless, his interpretation of the passage in Matthew 16 is also a synthesis that requires Peter as having a unique and primatial role in providing a vital application of the rock in Matthew 16, 18. He wrote, quote, that natural and primary foundation, so to speak, of the church is Christ. So here, you know, Kenrick begins by, you know, trying to incorporate what uh, some of the church fathers taught when they uh, made an emphasis on Christ being the rock. We see this in the later writings of Augustine, for example. Kenrick goes on, the architectural foundation that laid by Christ is the 12 apostles. So he, here he gives, he gives, uh, he gives uh, a, a, an, another interpretation that you find in the fathers and in, 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 in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians chapter two, uh, where the foundation of the church is the 12 apostles. Kenrick goes on among whom Peter is the eminent by virtue of the primacy. In this explanation of the word rock, making an allusion to Matthew 16 here, the primacy of Peter is guarded as the primary ministerial foundation, close quote. That's on page 112 uh, to 113 of that book. So if you read his speech, uh, which was later published, um, that he delivered at the council, um, Kenrick is not just coming out saying, hey, look, the majority of the fathers of the church reject the uh, Catholic teaching of Matthew 16. Therefore, um, you know, this Matthew 16 passage provides absolutely no support for the Catholic doctrine of the papacy. That's really not how Kenrick understood this. What he wanted to do was offer a synthetic interpretation of Matthew 16, which is actually not that opposed to what the Catholic Church herself does. I'll explain that later. Um, and so he incorporates this, you know, the idea that the rock is ultimately Christ, but Peter, um, as well as the other apostles, are also the foundation of the church, as, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, and as many of the church fathers say. But even within that, there's a further, uh, there's a further detail that in the midst of the apostles, Peter comes out uniquely um, and having um, a sole, unique role as the primary ministerial foundation um, that has the character of primacy, uh, or of governmental primacy, um, and he and he says that that could be explained uh, as a, a valid interpretation of the word rock in Matthew sixteen eighteen. However, he did think that the raw text itself in Matthew sixteen eighteen didn't give enough evidence to force that interpretation. So he was showing a lot of hesitancy. Um, he certainly didn't disbelieve that the Roman pontiff was infallible when he teaches ex cathedra, although before he agreed to the majority opinion at the council, he did have more of a Gallican view. For those listeners who don't know, the, the Gallicans largely, they all agreed with the divine institution of the papacy. However, they did not believe that the Pope could on his own issue an ex cathedra teaching that would be infallible. He had to add to him, add to that the, um, the general consensus of, of, or the general judgment of the Episcopal College alongside it. And in that way, uh, the in infallibility would be guaranteed. Um, of course, he, he revoked that when he agreed with the council. Then Dr. Dalcor uh, moves on to cite another witness that he claims uh, is, is, a, is a voice of opposition. Uh, at, at, uh, at the time mark, one hour, 35 minutes, 44 seconds, Dr. Delcor attempts to cite from a Hector Byrne Murdoch, who lived from 1881 to 1958, who claim who he claims, Dr. Dor Dr. Delcor claims, is a Roman Catholic apologist who supposedly admits, quote, 
None of the writings in the first two centuries describe St. Peter as a bishop of Rome. Close quote. However, Hector Byrne Murdoch, uh, contrary to what Dr. Dalcor claims, was not even a Catholic, let alone a Roman Catholic apologist. He was a member of the Scottish Episcopal Church. Moreover, Byrne Murdoch is completely misquoted. What he says is actually the following. More, quote, Moreover, the records of the first two centuries, at least, although they are fairly copious, do not yield us a clear statement that a bishop of Rome is individually and more than other bishops, the successor of St. Peter, close quote. That's from his book, The Development of the Papacy. Um, um, and that was published out in 1954, page 40. Uh, so, you know, Heck, you know, Hector Byrne Murdoch is a, he, he's not a Catholic, so he's not an apologist. So this statement of his um, is not really, uh, it, it doesn't have as much force now because he's obviously not a believer in the Catholic faith. He doesn't believe in the papacy. So as he's writing, um, it's not, it doesn't serve as the hostile witness that Dr. Delcor uh, wants him to be. Um as to the claim that none of the writings in the first two centuries describe St. Peter as a bishop of Rome, uh, we can accept that um, uh, as, as from a historical point of view. Um, not everything was written down that, uh, well, we have to understand, not everything that was believed in the first 200 years of the church was written down. Uh, much was communicated orally. Um, and even what was written down was not always preserved. Um, it wasn't always thought to be preserved. And even those things that were thought to be preserved, uh, not everything lasted that long. Not everything was copied to a, a, an excessive amount to have a record of it that survives for centuries and centuries. So um, all, what, what I would say is that the first two centuries, um, if we're talking about two centuries after our Lord, meaning he died in 33 AD, ascended into heaven. That would mean two centuries after 33, which is 233. Um, in, we already, in, in the third century, we do get some clear claims to the Petrine Foundation of the Church of Rome. But uh, I don't want to focus too much on that. I just wanted to point out that this was not a hostile witness, and it doesn't really give leverage to Dr. Dalcor's uh, claim uh, So let's go into the meat of this. Uh, do the church fathers reject the Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16? The Holy Scriptures and the Holy Fathers of the Church give a synthetically harmonious interpretation of rock, Petros, that can have a multi-layered definition. Thus, the rock of Matthew 16 need, need not only have um, a woodenly singular meaning, and this is what I mean by this. Uh, Protestants like Dr. Delcor and, and many others, um, the, what they, the, when they hear that the rock is Peter or the rock is the confession of Peter or the rock is um, the, the virtue of trust in Peter or that it's Christ alone as the rock, um, a lot of Protestants read this as competing meanings, uh, competing interpretations of Matthew 16. And what I want to say here is that neither the Catholic Church nor the Church Fathers, the majority of the Church Fathers, and especially those of the most important uh, listing in, in, Catholic, uh, in the Catholic patrimony, uh, they do not see in, uh, a competitive interpretation between these these various meanings. For them, it converges all into one truth that's multifaceted. It's multi-layered. And I, I understand that this might sound kind of like an attempt to nuanceify uh, the situation, but that's not the case, and I'm going to show that. Uh, so just be patient and allow the Catholic Church to give its own view on Matthew 16, as well as let's let's give the church fathers a chance to give their interpretation. But I, I want to be very clear that what I'm going to be showing is that Dr. Jalcor um, 
he sees an author in the early in the early centuries of the church saying that the, the that the rock is the confession of faith as a uh, as an opposing meaning than what the Catholic Church believes. Okay, or if or if he you know if he cites Saint Augustine like we'll see in his retractations, um, where he he kind of shifts his interpretation to the rock there being Christ. Uh, Dr. Delcor would say that that's an opposing view to the Catholic Church. So he he's putting in a competition, um, a a converse relation between the Catholic view of Matthew 16 and what he's seeing in these church fathers. So let's move on. One can hold that Peter the man person is the rock while also holding that Peter's confession of faith um, is the rock or that Christ ultimately is the rock. We can put this together into a synthesis by saying Simon the man is renamed as Peter or rock and thus something pertaining to his person carries the significance of rock. Moreover, that which pertains to Peter's person and which gives him the significance of rock is his faith, and thus the rock is traced back to Peter's faith. After all, we do not mean Peter's flesh and blood is the rock foundation of the church. And lastly, because Peter the man was given his illumination by God to confess Jesus as Israel's long-awaited Messiah, the rock can ultimately be traced even further back to the identity of Jesus as the firmest aspect of the rockness of Peter. And so what I mean here is this is a way to uh, show the harmony and the convergence of these uh, primary three meanings of the passage. You know, Dr. Delcor seems to think that the Catholic Church is, is, is obsessed with trying to find Peter the human as the rock. But the Catholic Church, as we'll see, and the Church Fathers uh, as well, they don't see this. They see Simon, the disciple, and the occasion for his being renamed Petros is his confession of faith. And so because, because Peter's becoming the rock is on is, is during this occasion where he's making a confession of faith, um, the rock significance is directly related um, or even directly caused by his confession of faith. And so the significance of the rock has to be his confession of faith. Um, even if we're talking about something that pertains to the person of Peter. And then, uh, moreover, because his confession of faith has as its object Christ the Lord, Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah of Israel, that also, uh, because faith is, faith is defined by its object, that also bears relation to the significance of the rock, um, and the transition from Simon to Petros. And so this is all, it's all, this can be a kind of, kind of convergence and a harmony to the, what, what the passage means. So let's see what the Catholic Church uh, says about Matthew 16, okay? In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 424, we read the following. Moved by the grace of the Holy Spirit and drawn by the Father, we believe in Jesus and confess, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. On the rock of this faith confessed by St. Peter, Christ built his church. I'll let the readers reread that slowly. Because it's often, like Dr. Delcor seems to, to, to take, it's often understood that the Catholic Church just doesn't accept this. And uh, we do. In the Catechism, paragraph 552, we read further, quote, Through a revelation from the Father, Peter had confessed, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Our Lord then declared to him, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Christ, 
the living stone, thus assures his church, built on Peter, of victory over the powers of death. Because of the faith he confessed, Peter will remain the unshakable rock of the church. His mission will be to keep this faith from every lapse and to strengthen his brothers in it. Close quote. I'll let the readers reread that. So we see here that um, this is... Uh, Matthew 16 is centered upon the faith of Peter. And there's also this, there's also a bit, tid, a tidbit here saying that Christ, the living stone, which also is like a hint that Christ has ultimacy as the rock foundation of Peter himself. And, you know, Christ as the builder is building upon Peter's faith, but because the faith of Peter is not severable, it's not separable from Peter the man in this context, um, we see a convergence of all these things. Peter the man, Peter's faith, and Christ as the, uh, having ultimacy in, in this rock significance in Matthew 16. In Pastor Eternus, this is uh, the eternal shepherd uh, referring to our Lord, um, which is the first dogmatic constitution of the Church of Vatican I, 1870, we read the following, quote, Therefore, whoever succeeds to the chair of Peter obtains, by the institution of Christ himself, the primacy of Peter over the whole church. So what the truth has ordered or ordained stands firm, and blessed Peter per perseveres in the rock-like strength he was granted and does not abandon that guidance of the church, which he once received, close quote. So right there in, in 1870 at the first Vatican council, um, the significance of rockness in Matthew 16 is not Peter to the human, his flesh and blood. Um, here it's, it speaks of the rock like strength that he was granted. Now, what, what does Matthew 16 say that matches that? Well, Jesus said it. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to Peter, but, but God the Father who drew him and gave him the gift of faith. For no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says. And so the rock of the church is traced back to this strength and illumination given to, uh, to St. Peter. Therefore, we see that rock in Matthew 16, even according to the Catholic Church, does not need to have a necessary competition between Peter the man, his confession of faith, nor Christ the Son of the living God. There is a manner in which they can converge into a multi-layered truth. Dr. Delcor assumes that there must be a competition between these meanings. And with that as a presupposition, he falls into the error of trying to find unnecessary variance between the church fathers who show the kind of diversity on Matthew 16 that the Catholic Church herself embraces, as is shown by the authoritative sources cited above. What do the church fathers say? Now, we don't have time to go through all the church fathers. We would be here for, you know, weeks. But um, because Dr. Delcor makes it a point to say that the most important church fathers opposed Rome's interpretation or the Catholic Church's interpretation of Matthew 16, I'll be going through some of the biggest names um, in the uh, Catholic patrimony um, where you, we're going to be able to see that the, they actually agree perfectly with the Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16 as Peter being the rock of the church. Now, before I go on here, um, <laughs> you'll see me possibly get a little bit enthusiastic here as I'm reading these citations. Um, here's a preliminary remark to keep in mind. I don't think that every one of these 
uh, citations from the church fathers um, necessarily proves the Catholic Church's uh, fully developed teaching about the papacy at Vatican I. But because Dr. Delcor's presentation was so intent upon severing uh, Peter and the rock in Matthew 16, such that Peter and the rock are absolutely different, um, all I'm interested in here is showing that uh, just like the Catholic Church, the Church Fathers and the most important Church Fathers are all pretty much unanimous in agreeing, no, no, they're not different things uh, and that they, they need to intersect. And so um, this is not an attempt to say, oh, this verse proves the papacy, this verse proves the papacy. But what I am doing is I'm showing that Dr. Delcor's presentation, his primary argument, is it, that it, it's not supported by the fathers that he claims um, supports him in his argument. So I've shown that a multi-layered interpretation of the Matthean rock is the way the Catholic Church herself interprets the rock in Matthew 16. And since plain reason shows that it is not only possible, but also likely, we should approach the Church Fathers with the very same interpretive lens where and when they do not show competition between the various meanings of the one passage. However, since it would take an enormous amount of time to go through each and every church father, I've already said this. I'm just making the point uh, again here on the slide. So let's get into this. The first father I want to look at is St. Basil the Great. And he lived in uh, 330 to 379. And he says the following, quote, The Lord's descent on the earth was likened to a mountain because the mountain is high ground. But the flesh of the Lord also, being earth according to its common nature, was exalted through union with God. And the house of God on the top of the mountains is the church, according to the expression of the apostle. For he says one must know how one ought to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the foundations of which are on the holy mountains for she has been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. One such mountain was also Peter, and the Lord promised to build his church upon this rock. For high and elevated thoughts transcending earthly things are fitly referred at, to as mountains. The soul of the blessed Peter has been called a high rock, because it is firmly rooted in faith and is steadfast and unyielding towards the blows directed against its by temptations. Close quote. This is on St. Basil's commentary on Isaiah. And you can get that uh, reference there at the bottom there. I got this from a commentary on the prophet Isaiah uh, translated by Nikolai Lipatov. You can actually access that on academia.edu for free if you have an account with them. Um, so here you have St. Basil making a clear reference to the Matthean promise in Matthew 16, the Lord's promise to build his church upon this rock, which is Peter, the man. And he actually even specifies the soul of the blessed Peter has been called a high rock. So clearly St. Basil believes that Peter is the rock. However, in other writings of St. Basil, and I'm not going to quote those because I think we should all take it for granted that uh, many of the church fathers speak about Peter's confession of faith being the rock or even Christ being um, having ultimacy uh, in terms of this rock significance. Um, Basil doesn't see competition between this. Otherwise, we need to say that Basil contradicted himself. But the Catholic Church doesn't contradict itself when we hold, as, as I showed from the sources, that the confession of faith is the rock, but also that this bears significance to Peter, the, the man himself as well. So we don't need to impute contradiction to St. Basil the Great. 
The next church father I want to look at is St. Cyril of Alexandria, who lived from 376 to 444. He writes uh, in his commentary on the gospel according to St. Matthew, the following, quote, that by the words on this rock, I shall build my church, Christ makes Peter its pastor. Literally, he places Peter over it as shepherd, close quote. And uh, the Greek word uh, for poimena that's used there uh, for he places Peter over it as uh, point, uh, poimena, shepherd. Um, that is the new, that's the Koine Greek New, new Testament uh, word for shepherd as well, in many instances, and, and enough to show that this is, the, this is a valid translation in the English. Um, so St. Cyril of Alexandria is going right to, to Matthew 16, the rock, the promise of building the church on Peter the rock. And for him, he understands that um, Peter's name being changed from Simon to rock, Petros, um, is the inauguration of Peter as the shepherd of the whole church. In his commentary on John 1.42, he writes, quote, he changes his name to Peter, meaning Simon. He changes the name of Simon to Peter, naming him after Petra because he was about to found his church on him, close quote. That's in his commentary on John 142. You can get the reference there at the bottom. This is an ancient Christian text uh, translated by David Maxwell. This is uh, put out by InterVarsity Press in 2013. Uh, you can get the uh, page number there at the bottom. But St. Cyril of Alexandria here is doing the same thing that St. Basil does because we know in other writings of St. Cyril, he talks about the rock in Matthew 16 being the confession of faith. That it's not Peter's flesh and blood. It's not his human nature. It's the confession of faith, his, his, his firm commitment to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And yet, we've got these other statements where he clearly shows that in harmony with that is the pastoral inauguration of Peter as the shepherd, um, which shows that the rock significance of Peter, the man, is intertwined with, with his confession of faith. And um, in the second passage, it's clear that the name change carries this significance that, that Christ is going to build his church on him, which is a reference to, to Peter, the man. St. John Chrysostom, uh, he lived from 347 to 407. And uh, this is what he says in his commentary on St. Matthew, uh, on the very, <laughs> the very text, 16, uh, Ch Matthew 16, 18. He says, quote, and I say unto you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. That is on the faith of his confession. Let's pause right there. So this would be one of those texts where a Protestant, um, sometimes an Eastern Orthodox, will go to try and find an opposition to the Catholic meaning or the Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16. But let's continue on. And I think we'll see something different. Christian continues saying, Thus he shows many will believe and raises his mind and makes him shepherd. Let me pause there. That's just an echo of what St. Cyril said uh, before. That, um, you know, the occasion of, of Peter's confession of faith, his being named the rock, is the inauguration of him as a shepherd. Let's get back to Chrysostom here. He goes on. Do you see how he himself leads Peter to high thoughts of him and reveals himself and shows that he is the son of God by these two promises? For those things which are peculiar to God alone, namely to forgive sins and to make the church immovable in such a an onset of waves, and to declare a fisherman to be stronger than any rock 
while all the world wars against him. These things he himself promises to give. Quote, let me pause here. So we see here that the rock significance, or as Vatican I said, the rock-like strength that was given to Peter. Okay? That's what Chrysostom here is talking about. Number one, the ability to forgive sins. That's the binding and loosing power that comes from the, the, the keys. And then also um, to make the church immovable because building the church on the rock, Christ does this so that the, the, the waves of opposition or the storm of opposition doesn't knock the church over. So Peter is being given this strength um, so that he could be like a rock to withstand the wars against against him uh let's get back to chrysostom here he continues as the father said speaking to jeremiah that he would set him as a column of brass so here chrysostom brings in um a, a passage from jeremiah where god promises to make jeremiah a column of brass and as a wall so you know chrysostom is comparing peter to that uh, th that passage in Jeremiah where uh, God is going to make him a column of brass, which which is a which is significant to Jeremiah the man. Um, I don't know any Protestant Old Testament exegete that would try and say that Jeremiah is to be severed from some kind of confession of faith or something else other than Jeremiah himself. And yet here, uh, Saint John Chrysostom is using this as a parallel uh passage well, let's go on he, he he continues but but him jeremiah for one nation israel this man peter for all the world let me pause there so so chrysostom here is saying that peter is being made a column of brass and as a wall just like jeremiah was but jeremiah was made that for the nation of israel meaning the prophet, the shepherd, the, the 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 spokesman of the Lord for Israel. But Christ does this for Peter for the whole world. Let's get back to Chrysostom. He says, I would ask those who wish to lessen the dignity of the Son, which gifts were greater, those which the Father gave to Peter or those which the Son gave to him? The Father gave to Peter the revelation of the Son, but the Son gave to Peter to sow that of the Father and of himself throughout the world. Again, sowing meaning the mission, the Christian mission. Christensen goes on, And to a mortal man he entrusted such authority over all things in heaven, giving him the keys who extended the church throughout the world and declares it to be stronger than heaven. Close quote. And you can get that. You can find the Latin if you want at Petrologia Greca 58.534. And again, a homily 54 at New Advent. Uh, you can get the English here uh, from Schaff's uh, series on the fathers. But in any case, um, the point here is that St. John Chrysostom does not make a competition between uh, building the church on the confession of faith of Peter while that having unique and... Um, individuated significance for Peter, the man himself. Just like Jeremiah was singled out, Peter is singled out and given this authority, this rock-like strength for the role as the, um, as the spokesman or the minister or the prophet to the new people of God, not just in Israel, but to the whole world. Now, Chrysostom elsewhere can 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 make um, statements about the keys and how John St. John carried the keys, and he's got all kinds of other statements. Um, although I would say that there's a there's definitely a high volume in Chrysostom's writings on the unique primacy of Peter as a universal shepherd. I don't have time to go into that now, but um, the point is made here um, that St. John, just like the Catholic Church, does not see a necessary competition between confession of faith and Peter the man as the Petros in, uh, or the Petra in Matthew 16. The next church father I want to look at is St. Ambrose. He lived from 339 to 397. 
and uh, he writes in uh, an oratio in Psalmum, uh, one of the Psalms, he writes the following, quote, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Where therefore Peter is, there is the church. Where the church is, there is no death, but eternal life. And he also adds, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Against blessed Peter, neither has the gates of Hades prevailed, nor the gate of heaven shut. But on the contrary, he has, de he has destroyed the forecourt of Hades and thrown open the heavenly one. Close quote. So here... Uh, Ambrose is, is, is citing Matthew 16, 18, the rock passage. Um, and notice how he, he draws an architectural parallel, a parallelism uh, between the rock of the church. Because if you have a rock, meaning the foundation of the church structure, wherever that rock is, that's where the church is. Wherever the foundation stone is, that's where the structure is. In the same way, wherever Peter is, there is the church. So Peter, a reference to Peter, has to be the rock. Because where Peter is, there's the church. Wherever the foundation is, there is the structure. And then uh, he, he adds, he adds these, these attributes there in the, uh, in the second or third sentence. Against blessed Peter, not against his faith, although that's definitely what's ultimately the meaning, but but here he doesn't specifically say Peter's faith. He says Peter the man. Against blessed Peter the man, neither has the gates of Hades prevailed, nor the gate of heaven shut, but on the contrary, he has destroyed the forecourt of Hades and thrown open the heavenly one. Close quote. Now, this definitely has significance to Peter's confession of faith. Elsewhere, Ambrose makes that clear. But what I'm trying to show here is just like the other fathers, there is no necessary, uh, there is no necessary converse relation or an opposition between saying Peter the man is the rock and Peter's faith faith is the his confession of faith is the rock as well. The next church father I want to cite from is uh, Saint Gregory of Nazianzen, or Saint Gregory the Theologian. Uh, he lived from three twenty nine to three ninety. Uh, he spoke in a recorded sermon saying that Peter is the head of the church according to the privilege granted him by the Lord. Peter is that unbreakable and most solid rock upon which the church, um, upon which the Savior built his church. Close quote. That's in Patrologia Graeca 46.733. And uh, English translation I got from the source there, uh, cited at the bottom. Um, so in this passage, it's a very clear reference to Peter being the solid rock upon which the church is built. And it's right in the midst of St. Gregory talking about the pastoral headship of St. Peter. So if you want to go into the Greek, I gave you the reference there. Um, but this is kind of echoing St. Uh, Cyril of Alexandria, it's also referencing uh, or echoing St. John uh, Chrysostom. Um, well, actually, St. Gregory wouldn't be echoing St. Cyril. <laughs> He's uh, probably writing way before. Uh, St. Cyril was writing, you know, uh, obviously St. Cyril came later. But what, what I'm trying to say here is that there's, a, there, there's, a, there's, there's this parallelism that all these guys are saying that the rock significance of Peter, his name from Simon to Peter, his being the rock of the church, is directly related to his pastoral role as the shepherd of the church. The next church father I want to cite from is St. Hilary of Poitiers. He lived uh, even earlier, 310 to 367. And he says the following, Clearly, Peter's confession received an appropriate reward because he had seen the Son of God in the man. He is blessed and exalted for having directed his view beyond human eyes regarding not only that which was from flesh and blood, 
but perceiving the Son of God through the revelation of the Heavenly Father. And he was judged worthy to be the first one to recognize that what was in Christ was of God. O oh, happy, or O oh, blessed is the foundation of the church on account of the announcement of his new name. Worthy is the rock upon which the church is built, against which the laws of hell and the gates of Tartarus and all the prisons of death are broken. O oh, blessed porter of heaven, by whose decree the keys of eternity's entrance are handed over, and whose earthly judgment with heavenly authority has already been decreed, whatever has been bound on or loosed on earth acquires the status of the very same decree in heaven. Close quote. This is in his commentary on Matthew 16, 18. You can get the uh, translation there from uh, the English translation from D.H. Williams, patristic scholar in uh, Catholic University of America Press. Um, citation there at the bottom if you want to explore further. Uh, but here, St. Hilary is talking about Peter the man. Okay, He opens up by saying clearly, Peter's confession received an appropriate reward. But let's think about that. Does a confession receive an appropriate reward? Does Hillary go on to say that not Peter, but rather his confession as kind of like a floating, invisible floating reality outside of Peter was rewarded? No, no. We know that because here he says um, he was judged worthy. Okay, Peter was. Um, he is blessed and exalted, right? Who is? His confession or Peter? And then when it says, oh, happy is the foundation of the church. Well, why is the foundation of the church happy? Because it's on a certain account. He tells us on account of the announcement of his new name. So the blessedness of the foundation is, is because of the new name given to the person, Simon, which is he was given the name Petros, rock. Worthy is the rock, okay? And then he goes on uh, to talk about uh, the, the blessed porter of heaven. It's another way of referring to like a gatekeeper, one who opens and shuts, okay? The keys are in the hands of St. Peter. And so this is also uh, kind of going along with St. Cyril, St. John Chrysostom, and as we just saw, St. Gregory of Nazianzen, that the, uh, the foundation role, the role of being the rock of the church it corresponds directly to this role of being the gatekeeper, um, sort of authoritatively governing the the membership and the dismembership principles and criteria uh, of the church on earth. The next father I want to look at is St. Jerome. Uh, he lived from 342 uh, to 420. Uh, writing to Pope St. Damasus, he states, quote, I speak with the successor of the fisherman, with the disciple of the cross, following none in the first place but Christ. I am in communion with your beatitude, that is, with the chair of Peter. On that rock I know the church is built. Whoever shall eat the lamb outside this house is profane. If any be not with Noah in the ark, he shall perish in the flood. Close quote. That's letter 15 in the epistolary of Jerome. You can access that at New Advent. Now look at this. <clears throat> we know he's speaking to uh, the Pope. It says that I speak to the successor of the fisherman. The fisherman is obviously a reference to St. Peter the Apostle. And uh, with a disciple of the cross, that's hearkening back to St. Peter's um, popular martyrdom, uh, his, his being crucified upside down in Rome under Nero, following none in the first place but Christ. So Jerome tells us he's a Christocentric Christian. They're like, there's no other kind of Christian. Um, but this, is, this shows us that Jerome is, you know, he wants Christ alone. You know, sola Christus, here it is. Jerome is talking about this. But, or I should say, uh, say primarily Christ, you know. 
Um, Christ is first. Christ is all. Definitely, Jerome is definitely going in that direction. But notice how he says that as a result of being Christocentric, he has to be in communion with the chair of Peter because he believes that Christ created the chair of Peter. And we know that because he says, on that rock, I know Christ built his church. And what is the chair of Peter? That's the Cathedra Petri. It's obviously a, a reference to the, um, the Episcopal throne at Rome, where, where, where Peter's station was left uh, when he died. And, and, and he, he, he makes a reference to Matthew 16, 18, on that rock. And here, is, uh, it's not even Peter the man that's in view, but his office, his officium, uh, Peter's office in Rome, is, is being linked up with Matthew 16, 18 here. Um, and then he says, whoever shall eat the lamb outside this house is profane. So again, he, he, here we he, we we bring in the architectural imagery of of the church being built on a rock. So we've got this this um, structural analogy: the rock and then the structure on top of the rock. Um, those who participate in the Eucharist outside of that structure, um, not within the confines of that structure that's on the rock of the chair of Peter, um, they are profane, meaning they're. They're eating outside of, of, of the legitimacy. Um, and so you can't, you can't have Eucharistic participation. You can't eat Christ um, it, it without, uh, with, with, without injury to, to the faith um, unless you have it within the communion of, uh, of his beatitude, meaning the, the successor of Peter. And look at this last sentence. If any be not with Noah in the ark, and since this is coming right on the tail of talking about the single structure built upon the Cathedra Petri, um, he's putting he's that means Noah's Ark has to be that structure on the Cathedra Petri as well. If any be not on the uh, be with, not with Noah on the Ark, he shall perish in the flood. Um, and this is something that the medieval popes brought out more and more. Um, you'll see in some of the. Uh, some of the bulls and decrees about the the exclusivity, the unity, uh, and the singularity of the Catholic Church um, as parallel or imaged in Noah's Ark, and how that relates to the the papacy. But in any case, Jerome here gives us a clear illustration because elsewhere Jerome does uh, say that uh, the confession of faith is the rock. Um, but look at how harmonious it could be. In, in such a biblical scholar as Jerome with uh, with Peter the man and even with Peter's officium, the Cathedra Petri, the chair of Peter in Rome. So now we go to St. Augustine who lived from 354 to 430. Um, and I, I, you know, I want to bring out this passage because uh, a lot of Protestants like Dr. Dalcor will go to um, Augustine's retractations, where uh, it seems like uh, Augustine is changing his mind. You know, a lot of Protestants call the retractations like the retractions. That's not exactly the in the in the Latin. It's retractionis um, or considerations, second considerations. Um, and and in in this passage that uh, uh, that we're going to be citing here, Augustine does make an adjustment to his interpretation of Matthew 16, 18. Uh, but I don't think it has the significance that Dr. Delcor or other Protestants would like it to have, such as, um, you know, the classic uh, William Webster, uh, Dr. James White, or some of your more modern um, critics of Catholicism. So let me, let me read what Augustine says here, and you can see it on the screen. In my first book against Donatus, I mentioned somewhere with reference to the Apostle Peter that the church is founded upon him as upon a rock. This meaning is also sung by many lips in the lines of Blessed Ambrose, where speaking of the domestic cock, he says, when it crows, he, the rock of the church, absolves from sin. Let me, let me pause there. 
Augustine here is already giving us a ratification that Ambrose said that the church that the church is built on Peter, and many lips. So he understands that that's uh, it's a and it's it's an interpretation that many take. Um, and so Ambrose is giving us, I mean, not Ambrose, Augustine is giving us Ambrose's interpretation as well as, well as many others who follow Ambrose. But let's, let, let's continue with Augustine. He, he says, but I realize that I have since frequently explained the words of our Lord, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, to the effect that they should be understood as referring to him whom Peter confessed when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And as meaning that Peter, having been named after this rock, figured the person of the church, which is built upon this rock and has received the keys of the kingdom of heaven. For what was said to him was not, Thou art the rock, but Thou art Peter. But the rock was Christ, having confessed whom, I, even as the whole church confesses, Simon was named Peter. Which of the two interpretations is more likely to be correct? Let the reader choose, close quote. That's in Retractations, Book 1, Chapter 21, Patrologia 32.618. I got the translation from Edward Giles, Documents of Papal Authority, from 96 to 4, uh, 450 or 461 on page 177. In any case, um, Augustine here. Let's 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 just start out with some minor observations. Augustine recognizes that many people, um, and Ambrose no less, hold to the interpretation that the rock in Matthew sixteen is Peter. And so that shows that Augustine would have no problem with the Catholic interpretation, right? Um, as opposed to a, a Protestant who sees you know a problem with the Catholic interpretation. And not every Protestant, as we'll see towards the end. Um, Dr. Delcor is definitely in the minority. Um, but Augustine has no problem with this. He's open to the he's open to being corrected almost, it seems, in this in this retractation. Um, the second thing I want to say is it's a it, he's not really departing so violently from what Ambrose and others are saying, because he says, as I underline here in bold and in italic. That Peter was given, you know, Simon was given the name Peter after this rock. So here you, you have this convergence thing going on again, where Christ has the ultimacy as the rock, but Simon, because the object of faith is, is Christ, Simon is made to be some sort of figuring of the church or the rock of of the church because of his being named after the ultimate rock christ and so simon is still hooked in to the petra of matthew 16 here whereas uh protestant polemicists tend to want to make a greater distance from the petra upon which christ builds the church and petros uh the man here here augustine sees a uh, definitely a um, a participation of one in the other, which is to be distinguished from some of our Protestant polemicist friends. Uh, the next church father I want to look at is Pope St. Leo the Great. He lived from 400 to 461. And the reason why I chose Pope St. Leo the Great is because no Protestant historian that I know of, no uh, historical theologian that's not Catholic, uh, that I know of, um, is going to deny that St. Leo the Great uh, gave to the New Testament the same interpretation of Peter as the Vatican Council. Um, you can find this in, in many, many prestigious uh, non-Catholic historians. I actually have an article on my blog, ericibard.org. Um, you can actually uh, uh, access that. It's it's if you type in in the search menu um, or the search box historiography Leo the Great, and you'll find an article with like twenty non-Catholic uh, historical theologians who all admit that Pope Saint Leo the Great gave precisely to uh, the Matthean passage, the Lucan passage, the Johannine passage, all those 
um, those uh, Christo Petrine commissions, um, the Catholic reading. And yet, let's let's see what he says here in uh, the fifth sermon uh, in the collection of his sermons. Uh, Saint Leo writes the following quote: "There is a further reason for our celebration." This is uh, it's actually a homily he gave on the anniversary of. Uh, uh, it was on an anniversary of either I think it was either Peter's uh, martyrdom, his, or his 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 election to the throne of Peter. In either way, this is a celebratory homily. So let's start again. Quote, there is a further reason for our celebration. Not only the apostolic, but also the episcopal dignity of the most blessed Peter, who does not cease to preside over his see and obtains an abiding partnership with the eternal priest. For... The stability which the rock Peter himself was given by that rock, Christ, he conveyed also to his successors. And wheresoever any steadfastness is apparent, there is without doubt is to be seen the strength of the shepherd. Close quote. That's in Patrologia 54, 153. You can get that from uh, Giles' documents of. Uh, 281 to uh, 82, 282. So in this passage, what we see here is that the stability of Matthew 16 um, in, in the Petra of Matthew 16 is really, the, is really Christ. But Peter, the Petras, participates in the Petra, participates in the rockness of Christ. And then this is conveyed also to his successors. So what you see here is a pope who um, is unmistakably a papal supremacist, but who also has sort of like a a mix of an Augustinian flavor, as well as as the you know being clear that Peter the man in his pastoral role, right? Because it says episcopal dignity, um, his 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 shepherd, his role as shepherd, to 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 echo Cyril. Um, Gregory of Nazianzus and St. Gregory of Chrysostom and Jerome. Um, this is Peter's role as the episcopos of the church, basically. Um, and that's related to Christ be, having the ultimacy in being the rock. <clears throat> the last one I want to quote from is Pope Nicholas the Great, because I, I'm sure there's some Protestants who are going to say, well, I'm not sure what Eric said about St. Leo the Great being very um unanimous in historical theology and in in the you know in the halls of academia today um but here's one that is unmistakable okay pope saint nicholas the great is understood by eastern orthodox scholars protestant scholars and catholic scholars uh and even non-christian scholars um as a, a clear teacher of the universal supremacy universal jurisdiction and the infallible uh, capacity of Peter's successor fixed in the Roman See. Um, it's all there in in, in 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 some you know in some loud fireworks in his letters and decrees. And yet let's see how he interprets Matthew 16. He quotes, and this is actually a statement that he made in a letter to Emperor Michael the Third which was read aloud in the presence of the Council of Constantinople 869-870. I quote, The primacy of divine authority which the creator of the universe bestowed on his chosen apostles, basing its solidity on the solid faith of the prince of the apostles, namely Peter, he resolved would lie in his preeminent, indeed first sea. That's the Roman sea. For by the Lord's voice, it was said to him, you are Peter, and on this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell will no, not prevail against it. Peter, indeed, so named from the firmness of the rock, which is Christ, does not cease so to protect with his prayers the unshaken structure of the universal church fortified by the strength of the faith 
hearkening to his confession. That he hastens to correct the madness of those who stray from the rule of the Orthodox faith and bestows a reward on those who strengthen the church courageously so that the gates of hell, that is, the promptings of evil spirits and attacks by heretics are unable to break the unity of the same church, close quote. And you can get that there from uh, Liverpool University Press's uh, uh, publication, Richard Price's translation on the Council of Constantinople, 869, pages 192 to 93. All right. So here is an unmistakable papal supremacist. Nobody's disputing that. Nobody in the scholarship disputes this. And yet his interpretation of Matthew 16 shows this fluid harmony between these multi-layered ideas. Christ is the rock having ultimacy, Peter's faith being the uh, the primary significance of his rockness, um, but then Peter, the man himself, who by his prayers and intercessions guides the Roman church into uh, the government of the universal church. So you see all this coming in together as a convergence. And, and what we see in Dr. Delcor is that he wants to, he wants to, compete these things so that you can't have them all in one as we as i think i've shown from the the the, the teaching of the catholic church it, it, it herself in her authoritative decrees as well as in um all these most important church fathers uh they all agree um and and none of them are opposed to uh peter the man being the rock of the universal church all right, well, let's make a transition here into Matthew 16 itself. So here I'm going to be proceeding to uh, looking at the biblical text itself. So there's the citation, Matthew 16, 18. I say, uh, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I gave you the Greek here. As far as we know, the word Kephas or Petros was not an ordinary human name up to that point. If it were the goal of Jesus to make a massive difference between Petra, the rock, and Petros, the man, or Peter, the man, the last thing he would have done is bother changing Simon's name to Petros. Throughout the scripture, God changes the names of his people. Abram to Abraham, Sarah to Sarah, Jacob to Israel, Eliakim to, to, to Jehoiakim. Because their persons have obtained a new role, function, or mission in relation to the world of their influence. Therefore, it seems senseless for Jesus to change Simon to Petros if it truly were the case that Jesus wanted to sever the relationship between Peter, the man, and the real rock upon which Christ intended to build his, to build his church. Um, and, and what I mean here is that um, why give Peter or why give Simon the name rock if the significance of rock is something that Christ wants to differentiate from Peter, the man? It seems much more sensible that he puts them together. <clears throat> Interpreters who see in Matthew 16, 18, an exclusive reference to Peter's confession as opposed to Peter the man. Since the context is the confession of Jesus as the Messiah, we'll have to answer the question of why Jesus renamed Simon in two other significant places in scripture where there is no explicit intention to tie it to a confession of faith. And those two scriptures are John 1.42 and Mark 3.16. In Mark 3.16, Mark records the naming or the numbering of the apostles. And he says this, quote, and Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, he surnamed them Boanerges, which is sons of thunder, close quote. So you'll notice that when Mark is counting the apostles, he, he gets to Simon, and then gives Simon's surname, P 
Peter, and then he says James and John. Okay, this the James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James. Um, James and John are given their surname, which is Sons of Thunder. Now, that name, Boanerges, or Sons of Thunder, does that pertain to something related to the persons of John and James? Or something exterior to them? Something that's, um, something that's separable from them? No, the Sons of Thunder was given to them because of their, their thunderous personality. They're on fire for the faith. They put themselves out there like thunder. Okay? So that must mean then that when Simon is said to have this surname Peter, it's also likely to be related to the person of Peter. Because nothing around here is said about Simon confessing Jesus as the Messiah. And so what we have here is not a competitive interpretation as Simon as the rock, but just trying to illustrate that the primary meaning is that Simon, the man, is given this name because he is the rock. John 1.42, St. John says the following, quote, and he, and if I remember correctly, that's either uh, Nathaniel or Andrew, I think it's Andrew. And he brought him to Jesus. And when, G and it's talking about Andrew bringing Jesus, uh, sorry, bringing Peter to Jesus. So this is the first time Peter, or Simon, sorry. This is the first time Simon meets Jesus. And he, and Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas which is, by interpretation, rock. The last line there in Greek, kephas, is the Greek version, the Koine Greek version, of the Aramaic kepha. And that's very significant that John, a Greek writer, gives the Greek transliteration of the Aramaic form which means that the apostles were in the habit of calling Simon uh, Cephas. Um, that, that seems to be what Jesus first called Simon, which means that Jesus spoke Aramaic. Okay? The significance of that is actually uh, interesting. This is a side note. Uh, some Protestants in the past have tried to find a, um, a distinction between the feminine ending and the masculine ending in Matthew 16, 18, where, you know, you are Peter, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. Well, Petros and Petra, some some Protestants have said, well, and Petros is, is, a, is a regular stone. And so um, Jesus is trying to distinguish the two. Again, we're going back to this issue of trying to separate the two. Um, but that won't work because there's so much evidence that Jesus spoke Aramaic and that Simon Peter, or Cephas, was the original off-the-tongue way of referring to Simon um, amongst the apostles. We get this in Paul, too. He refers to Simon, uh, he refers to Peter as Cephas in many ways. Um, why? Well, it's because, well, why would they break away from the koine of Petros and refer and use the the, the Greek transliteration of the Aramaic, it's because they were in, they were in the habit of even, even when they were talking Greek amongst themselves, like when the apostles were together, even when they were talking Greek, they, they were so used to calling him Kephas that the Greek transliteration um, is what, what was the easiest way to continue um, and making it easier uh, to, to call him by his name. Um, and in Aramaic, there is no feminine, masculine uh, differentiation with kepha. So it literally be, you are kepha, and on this kepha, I'll build my church. Dr. Delcor argues that since Christ says, you are Peter and on this rock, rather than you are Peter and upon you, 
it clearly shows that Jesus intends to sever the equation between Peter the man and his confession of faith. However, this is certainly not necessary. It is just as easily read as a demonstrative adjective when this rock is used. In other words, let's read it this way. You are Peter and on this rock, meaning no other rock than what I just said, namely Peter. Understood in this way, Jesus is simply emphasizing Peter as the very rock he intends to build upon. This is further testified by how Jesus is immensely concerned to be directed to Peter the man. Let's read the verse of Matthew 16, 18 with this emphasis. Look closely here. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose will be loosed in heaven. Uh, so you see that there's an emphasis uh, of Christ on Peter here. The direction of his speech is about Peter. It's about him, the man, um, describing him as Simon Bar Jonah. You know, so, uh, uh, th this is this is talking about Simon. Um, what's been revealed to him, meaning Simon, has has been illuminated by the Father. And that he has this name now, Petros, that's related to Simon, the man. So you see, and then the giving of the keys, that's it's, it's talking about Simon, the man. Um, Dr. Delcor emphasized how the context is about Jesus, not Peter. However, these very words give explicit emphasis to Peter, the man. How strange would it be for this rock, Taute, Petra, meaning this rock, um, how how strange would it be for this rock in the midst of these words to mean something alien to Peter when he bo when when before and after Peter is the primary reference? It doesn't seem reasonable. But Dal but Doctor uh, Dalcor is correct that the context is centered upon Jesus as the Messiah. What significance does that have with this ecclesia, church, that he intends to build, and the keys of the kingdom? The long-awaited king of Israel, the son of David, was promised to regather the tribes of Israel and restore the kingdom of God on earth. Therefore, Jesus' emphasis on Simon as the rock foundation of this new society of God's people the church and the key holder by which to open and shut the gates of the kingdom only shows that Jesus's messianic identity shines even brighter in this new role he gives to Simon Peter because as the Messiah, he shows how he plans to inaugurate this new era of salvation history with the apostles surrounding their head, the apostle Peter. In other words, Dr. Delcor's, you know, his, you know, he's looking at this passage where Christ comes on the scene. It's like, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Blessed are you, Simon, because I am the Messiah. And so the, the context is on the the messian, the messiahship of Jesus, his identity as the Messiah. And so the Catholic fixation on Peter is like it's it's off kilter. But think about this: the role of the Messiah. You know, Psalm 2, Psalm 45, Psalm 110, um, uh, the second Samuel 7. The son of David was to come and to restore the kingdom, to rule the nations with a rod of iron. To, to be the son of man who has bestowed a kingdom, an everlasting dominion from sea to sea, from land to land, all over the four corners of the earth. And... Uh, so what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is giving to Peter a participation in his messianic authority. He's giving him, uh, he's making him the rock of the church because the Messiah is going to build the church. So this is definitely related to the, the messianic 
um, mission to build the temple um, in 2 Samuel 7 uh, on the rock of Peter. And and he gives him the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which is it's 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 the the symbol the symbolic imagery there is uh, talking about the authority um, of being the gatekeeper of knowing the conditions of entering the people of God, in other words, becoming part of the temple of God, or being dismembered from the temple of God, binding and loosing, loosing and binding. Um, so it, what he gives to Peter is still. Um, it's still integrally, intimately related uh, or directly related to the messianic mission of Jesus. So this, this you know, Dr. Delcor is putting tensions where they need not be. He's putting oppositions where they need not be. You've got both and. This is what the Catholic religion does. So what does non-Catholic scholarship do? We went through the past. There's so much more to say about the scripture. And the Greek exegesis of that passage, I'm sure that Dr. Delcor um, would have some issues and questions with, you know, how the exegesis is done um, in order to support the Catholic view. But um, I wanted to cite some non-Catholic scholarship here, some of the best uh, scholarship out there in the contemporary scholarly world, and, and see what they're saying. Because, you know, Dr. Delcor uh, imputed some motive where catholics have this motive to uh, want to see peter as the rock but let's see what orth eastern orthodox uh, have to say um according to dr ed Zichensky, who I, I know i've had the pleasure of meeting um and he's uh he's probably the best pen in the english world on byzantine theology and history but He's a prestigious Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox Byzantine theologian. He says the following, quote, The idea that Peter himself was the rock is certainly also part of the Eastern tradition, close quote. That's in his The Papacy and the Orthodox, released by Oxford University Press in 2017. So we have here a non-Catholic scholar, an Orthodox scholar, um, who, you know, Dr. Delcor knows that the Orthodox and the Catholics, this is the, the papacy is like the um, number one uh, uh, dividing issue. And yet he, even Dr. Sachensky can admit that scripturally, exegetically, and traditionally, rock is, is uh, Peter himself. In the late Father John Meyendorf's volume, The Primacy of Peter, this is put out by St. Vladimir Seminary Press in 1992. <laughs> Orthodox theologian Dr. Veselin Kashis states, quote, We may conclude that the early church fathers and the Christian writers recognized Peter's position of honor and preeminence in the New Testament period. He was the spokesman for the group of the Twelve, the leader, the shepherd, and the martyr. Their interpretation of Jesus' promise to Peter you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church, converge with those of modern exegetes. The rock is Peter, close quote. That's page 65. Father John Meyendorf himself, no passive critic of the papal claims, also states concerning the church fathers, quote, this same interpretation implicitly prevails in all the patristic texts dealing with Peter. The great Cappadocians, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Augustine all concur in affirming that the faith of Simon made it possible for him to become the rock on which is the church founded. Close quote. That's page 70. So Father John Meindorf, okay, um, he criticized the papacy quite a bit in his writings. And he's also very much, uh, very much bent in the direction of seeing Peter's faith is primary. Um, and that's how he interprets a lot of the fathers. But he understands that that's not to be severed from Peter the man. What about uh, Protestant non-Catholic scholarship? Uh, you've got Dr. Jonathan Lehman, a PhD in theology from the University of Wales. I had the pleasure of speaking with him many years ago. Uh, he's a prolific Baptist theologian, pastor, author, and editorial director for the well-known ministry, 
nine marks. And he states the following on Matthew 16, 18, quote, his grammar parallels Peter's. You are the Christ and you are Peter. Peter had just defined Jesus' identity and role in redemptive history as the Messiah. Now Jesus does the same for Peter, defining his identity and his role in redemptive history. In this case, as the rock or foundation on which the church will be built. Close quote. This is in his uh, InterVarsity Press book, uh, Political Church, the Local Assembly as Embassy of Christ's Rule, page 335. So here you have a guy, I mean, he's doing ministry um, with Mark Dever. <laughs> um, these are like, you know, Together for the Gospel, Gospel Coalition. Um, you know, these are some mainline evangelical um, people who are devoted to the solos of the Reformation. And, and, you know, he's very committed to biblical exegesis himself. Um, and and he even he can admit that uh, what you've got here in Matthew 16 is, is, a, is an identity of persons. Christ is being identified personally as the Messiah. Simon is being identified personally as the rock on which the church will be built. Perhaps one of the best Protestant New Testament exegetes in the world, D.A. Carson, one of my favorite, says the following, quote, if it were not for Protestant reactions against extremes of Roman Catholic interpretation, it is doubtful whether many would have taken rock to be anything or any one other than Peter, close quote. This is in his uh, his his grand commentary on, on on the Gospel according to Matthew, and the Expositor's Bible commentary put out uh, by Zondervan, in page three three sixty eight. Uh, so D. A. Carson's a guy who um, you know I used to be a Reformed Baptist, um, and I used to just read everything he wrote. To this day, if I see a new audio with him, I'll listen to it, even as a Catholic. The man is just immensely sharp, and his his knowledge of the scripture is just is it's it's uh it's it's uh, it's immense. Um, and he wrote a book on the exegetical fallacies. I mean, this is the guy who's there as like the he's like sharp, iron sharpens iron against all of his colleagues in in the Protestant world on you know making exegetical fallacies. And here. Him, you know, he's very much centered on uh, being faithful to the Greek text of Matthew 16, and he sees the Petra Petras equation. You know, the rock is Peter. Another world-renowned New Testament scholar, Dr. Craig Blomberg, writes the following, quote, Jesus' declaration, you are Peter, parallels Peter's confession, you are the Christ, as if to say, since you can tell me who I am, I will tell you who you are. The expression, this rock, almost certainly refers to Peter. Let me pause there. Dr. Delcor tried to use this, the Tao Te Petra, as a, as a way to sever Peter and the rock. Here, Blumberg says, the expression, this rock, almost certainly refers to Peter, following immediately after his name. Just as the words following Christ, the, the Christ in, in verse 16, apply to Jesus. The play on words in the Greek between Peter's name, Petros, and the word rock, Petra, makes sense only if Peter is the rock and if Jesus is about to explain the significance of this identification. Of course, as we showed, the significance of that identification is directly related to, the, to him being the key holder or the gatekeeper, or like the other fathers said, his role as pastor. Um, this is uh, Blomberg's commentary on Matthew, uh, the New American Commentary, uh, put up by Broadman Press, page uh, 251 to 252. Another world-renowned Protestant New Testament scholar, Craig Keener, states, quote, Jesus does not simply assign this role arbitrarily to Peter, however. Peter is the rock because he is the one who confessed Jesus as the Christ in the context, close quote. That's in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, 
put out by Erdman's uh, in 2009. Now, Keener, uh, he makes it a point in his commentary to distinguish uh, this from Roman Catholic applications of the passage to the papacy. However, he's adamant that the rock, Petra, and Petros is equated. Peter is the rock. For other resources, because um, I could, I can continue making citations, but uh, uh, I definitely want, uh, recommend reading the extensive commentary by R.T. Franz um, in his "The Gospel of Matthew," uh, the New International Commentary by of the New Testament by Ehrmans, uh, page six twenty to six thirty three. Also, see Leon Morris. Um, he's a an Aussie Australian. Uh, Australian Anglican, one of my favorite uh, Protestant writers, and his The Gospel According to Matthew and Erdman's um, put out in 1992, page 422 to 24. And then finally, Ulrich Luz, um, another critical commentator on the Greek text. He, uh, check out his commentary on Matthew 8 to 20, um, translated into the English by James Crouch, put out by Fortress Press, uh, page 366 to 68. And so what you have there is, you know, hefty scholarship in 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 the, in the Protestant world that's basically concurring with what I've been saying, what the Catholic Church has been saying, and what the Church Fathers, the most important Church Fathers, have been saying. So here's my conclusion, uh, sort of recapping everything about Dr. Darkol, uh, Dalcor's uh, presentation. First, Dr. Delcor misunderstands the meaning of ex cathedra in Catholic teaching regarding authoritative teaching uh, regarding the authoritative teaching office of the Pope. Dr. Delcor gave a slightly slanted description of the former Archbishop Kenrick of St. Louis on the Methane text. Dr. Delcor misquoted H. Byrne Murdoch and mistook him as a Roman Catholic apologist. Dr. Dalcor unnecessarily severs a multi-layered meaning to the rock of Matthew 16, 18, whereas the most important church fathers, by his own words, show precisely that the rock is both St. Peter the man and his confession of faith, and also at times Christ himself. They did not see a necessary competition between these meanings, but a synthesis or a convergence upon one true reality. Dr. Delcor gives an unpersuasive interpretation of Matthew 16, 18, based upon the principles of exegesis. Dr. Delcor's interpretation of Matthew 16, 18 is completely at odds with the majority of non-Catholic New Testament exegetes in contemporary scholarship, either from Eastern Orthodox or Protestant backgrounds. And lastly, I would like to extend uh, an invitation to Dr. Delcor or um, any of any anyone associated with his ministry who would like to do a live exchange uh, discussing what I've said here in this presentation or discussing what he mentioned in his presentation. Um, I, I, and I want to do this in charity because uh, I know that Dr. Delcor seemed to have been timed. He was given a short amount of time to really get out a lot of what he was trying to say because uh, it looked like he was a little bit rushed. So, um, with that being said, um, if he listens to this um, and you would like to respond um, or you know, touch on a lot of things I've talked about, um, I am open to doing an invitation. Uh, I'm open to doing a live dialogue on my YouTube channel um, or um, another another one that's presentable. Um, because look, a lot of what I've said does not get into the issue of succession, papal succession. Um, the papacy throughout the ages, the you know all the intricacies of Vatican I, and how that relates to other matters in, ch in the Church Fathers or in the Scriptures, um, because the you know Protestants definitely see, see issues with um, you know the Protestant scholars that I quoted here who see Peter as the rock. They don't they they they, they don't believe in the papacy, right? The, they see other things in the New Testament that would that would exclude it would preclude. Uh, the papacy. Um, don't have time. I didn't have time to go through all that in this presentation, but Dr. Dalcor would like to uh, extend this in another uh, dialogue. I am more than willing to uh, to accommodate. Before I go, I'd like to say if you if you liked this, 
um, please check out my YouTube channel, uh, which is just my name, Eric Ibarra. Subscribe. And um, if you uh, uh, if you'd like to read any of more of my material, I've written a number of books. Um, this one here is called. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen a little bit easier here. Okay, so this book I wrote is called Melchizedek and the Last Supper, Biblical and Patristic Evidence for the Sacrifice of the Mass. And this, uh, I wrote this for Protestants who are interested in understanding the biblical foundation of the church's doctrine on transubstantiation and the sacrifice of the Mass. Um, I, I firmly believe it's rooted in the scriptures. I have another book here um, called The uh, the Just Shall Live by Faith, Resolving the Catholic-Protestant Debate on Justification from Paul's Epistle to the Romans. And uh, boy, I really enjoyed writing this one. Um, it's, it's basically going through the Epistle to the Romans and, and looking at the exegesis and, and just weighing the evidence. Is it, is it pro-Catholic, pro-Protestant? Um, or, or maybe something else. Um, obviously, I land on the Catholic side of that uh, investigation. Uh, the third book I've written is on the filioque. Way. Um, this is a subtitle, Revisiting the Doctrinal Debate Between Catholics and Orthodox. Uh, it's a nice little hardcover here. Uh, so in... In about 300 pages, I deal with the controversy that separated the, the, the Latin and the Byzantine churches on the issue of the procession of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and the lastly, I wrote a, a small little book here called The Church Fathers on Rebaptism. Um, probably not a whole lot of uh, uh, interest based on that title for Protestant viewers, but definitely for Orthodox readers that you probably really like. Um, this this little book I wrote. So um, please, um, if you'd like to read that material, look it up on Amazon. Uh, there's there's hardback, paperback, and Kindle versions available. And with that said, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, William Albrecht's uh, presenters, and you have a blessed day.